resisting the technological enslavement system. This is the Live Free or Die radio show with your host, Lee Rogers. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the broadcast. Today is Wednesday, January 11th, 2012, and uh, yeah, we missed last night's broadcast, but I don't think we missed a whole lot with the New Hampshire primary fiasco and that whole circus. And guess what? I actually predicted the results the day before. So there you go. Uh, and I don't think we need to cover that any further. And it's it just more of the spectacle, more of the circus, more of the insanity. So uh, that's about all I have to say about that. But we are live here tonight, and we're going to be here commercial-free. And I know I didn't really mention I was going to have a guest on tonight, but we do have a guest. And uh, I just want to introduce my guest. We haven't had him on for a while, but we're going to be here for the next three hours. And we're going to talk about his new film, The Secret Right Volume 2. I'm joined here with Josh Reeves. You can check out his website at theglobalreality.com. And Josh, it's been a while since we've done any radios, but I think it's been like six months. But welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much, Lee, for having me back again. It's so great to be back with you. And, uh, man, we always have a good time when we do these shows. So I'm really looking forward to getting into all of it with you here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm glad to have you back on because I haven't talked with you literally in six months. And I know you've been doing a lot of research uh, for your film, which just came out, I think, what, a, a, like a month ago or so? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, we, we finished it right at the end of November. And uh, since then, we've had uh, kind of a slow small online release and uh now we're having the full release where people are now receiving their dvds and blu-rays and stuff so uh yeah this is kind of the kickoff so that's why it's great to be here with you uh right here at this moment as people are now starting to watch the film yeah and uh of course i just got the film i know we're discussing this off air and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the movie i just started watching a little bit of uh, uh of what's in it and uh why don't um, i give you the floor why don't you tell the audience exactly what sort of material you can expect to see in the Secret Right Volume 2. Well, absolutely, and I hope that uh, that's one of the things I'd like to do here tonight with you, Lee, is, is uh, you know, get into the, the, the details of a lot of this stuff uh, of the film. That way people kind of have an idea of where I'm coming from with this. But, uh, of course, it is the sequel to the first uh, Secret Right film that I put out in 2009. In that one, it was kind of uh, my... And it was kind of... Uh, it really didn't... That film didn't have a lot of focus to it because it was kind of... You know, I only found out about the CMP right around the, the time that you and I had started on radio back in 2007. And uh, so that was kind of me, you know, bleh, barfing everything that I had uh, found out about the group up to that point up in, in, into that film. And uh, as I was telling you before the, the, the show tonight, uh, the, that film, the CRI Volume 2, the reason it's saying it's so long for it to come out is because I changed really the, the way the film was going to be because as you've discovered in making your film on Phony Patriots, that, uh, I mean, there's just so much information. You, you kind of sometimes have to start to whittle some things down and leave some stuff in and leave some stuff out because there's just so much to it. Oh, absolutely. You're 100% correct. I mean, the film that I have that's coming out, literally, I have over five hours worth of material, and I probably could have a film with like 10 or 12 hours worth of material and not even scratch the surface. Uh, that's how insane it is. And I, I think part of the, the problem that we have here is that there have not been uh, enough researchers that have actually dug into this information and, and put it out there. So I think it's important to try to get as much of this as we can out and make people aware of this information because literally when you look at, at these groups like the Council for National Policy, the John Birch Society, and, and a lot of these psychological warfare operations that you mentioned, which I think the truth and patriot communities are certainly heavily involved in that, uh, I mean, this is a, a very I important part to understanding the entire system that is the New World Order. Absolutely, and getting back to your question there, and uh, you know, give me the floor to tell everybody what's in the film. That that that, that I could have said it better myself. I mean, that has been the, the the problem. Is there? There's been so much of this that because it fingers uh, certain individuals and certain connections to the highest levels of the New World Order, we haven't had access to this other end of the picture uh, up until people like yourself and me and others out there. Uh, started to research it. So we're, we're kind of at the early stages of this, and there's, there's going to be so much more for people to find out and, uh, and learn. But in this film, I really tried to focus on uh, the history of the sort of the truth uh, movement conspiracy genre, where that came from, where it started from. And, uh, and it, it was amazed to find out that even from the very beginning, you know, we're, we're talking about within a month after the Kennedy assassination, you, are, you already have the John Burt Society and people that were involved with the John Burt Society and people who were involved in starting 
uh, white nationalist groups here in the United States, were already starting the conspiracy genre and, uh, you know, getting everybody saying, okay, well, you know, here's the, here's the real truth and, you know, here's what's going on. But, um, you know, Oswald was a communist and so that's, you know, that's the real deal. And it, it was just amazing to go back and see the roots of this stuff. Re Revelo Oliver, he was the guy who published that, um, that, pa that paper that I was talking about there. It was called Marksman in Dallas. That was really the, uh, what is considered to be uh, really ground zero for the entire conspiracy genre. He was a John Birch Society member at that time. He went on to form uh, the National Alliance with William Luther Pierce, author of the Turner Diaries. And uh, this is the guy that, that single-handedly started the, uh, the, the, the conspiracy anti-New World Order movement in combination with, the, uh, uh, with John Birch Society. And just a few years after that, Oh, uh, about two years after that, 1966, is when you had uh, John McManus come on board with the John Bird Society. And uh, it, w what's funny is, is that for the longest time, you know, I had said and repeated in, in, in my shows and, and in my films that all the heads of the John Bird Society were Jesuit trained. Uh, and that, uh, one of the things I found out in my new film is, uh, from researching is actually is not true. Um, the one person who's been uh, the, the real top Jesuit of the whole thing has been John McManus. And he came in uh, really in the heart of the days when, uh, you know, you had Barry Goldwater on the scene, the real rise of, uh, you know, extremist right-wing politics that extended through the John Burt Society and extended in through white supremacist groups and uh, the KKK and all these different groups and then formed into, uh, in the 80s, with the formation of the Council for National Policy with Tim LaHaye, that's when we started to see the rise of the new right under Reagan. And that's when we started to see a, a, a change in right-wing politics. Ron Paul came out of that group. We started to see the rise of the, neo, of the neocons, of the Christian conservative movement. And uh, from that sprang up the uh, anti-New World Order uh, and uh, the patriot movement, the militia movement, that whole thing. But it was just fascinatingly to see how far this has gone back, where it really started from. And uh, we discussed that in about the first uh, first hour or so of the film, which is people can actually see online. They can go and uh, Google the Seawright Hour, uh, Seawright Volume Two, Hour One, and watch the first hour of that film online for free. And we get into uh, Anthony J. Hilder, who of course is the uh, uh, self admitted mentor of <coughs> none other than Alex Jones. Uh, very very interesting and uh, shady connections with Mr. Hilder. And these various right-wing groups that were also connected to the John Burt Society and connected to people who were fingered in the Kennedy assassination and put on trial, uh, the, the trial that was depicted in the uh, JFK movie that Oliver Stone made. So that's the first hour. And the second hour gets into uh, Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon. He gets into uh, the various uh, psychological operations that have been conducted from uh, people like... Uh, uh, the guy, I mean, Paul Vallali, I mean, this guy is one of the top birthers uh, on the birther issue that Jer Jerome Corsi took the ball and ran with and Jones covered in his uh, Obama deception film. I mean, it's been sort of uh, one of these dividing issues that always kind of seemed like a honeypot, something they were trying to get people to uh, get behind to further discredit legitimate info and things of that nature. But it was just amazing to me to find out that... Uh, this guy, Paul Vallali, was the head of all psychological operations for the military in the 1970s. And uh, him and Michael Aquino wrote this book, Mind War, where Jones' term info war, information warfare, originated from. And, and you can find out that Paul Vallali is also the uh, senior military analyst for Fox News. Um, it's, it's unbelievable the connections to psycholo psychological operations, the sex slave ring, ritualistic uh, murders, satanic uh, killings, all this stuff. Get into that in the second hour. Uh, also at the beginning, I'm sorry, this, the second part of the film, uh, but at the beginning of the second part of the film, we also get into show how many of the, the beginning members of the CMP were also Council on Foreign Relations members. A lot of the John Burt Society people were as well. Uh, so that, that, that whole second hour pretty much gets into that. And then the last hour or so of the film deals with Alex Jones. Uh, we get into all his connections, Adnan Kashiogi, all this different stuff. And a little bit of Ron Paul stuff there at the end, and a little brief mention of the uh, Rock Wall and the mysterious Rock Wall in Rockwall, Texas, which is going to be my next film. So there's uh, it's two hours and forty eight minutes, and uh, there's there's lots of stuff in there that people can dive into and, and do research on their own and and take notes and take down names when they watch this thing because um, I mean I, as you were talking about Lee, you find 
it seems like every time you go and you find one piece of information, there's 20 other connections connected to that one piece of information that are relevant and, and prove the point of what you're trying to, to find in the thesis you're trying to make in this research. And it's just mind-blowing. There's just absolutely no way you can put it all in, in one film or, or five films. I could do six more movies. You told me you had, what, five hours for your new film? That's, that's insane. Yeah, it's like a spider web. I and mean, once you start looking to one individual that's connected to all this, then you see how he's connected to three or four more people, and it never ends. And what I see that's a very constant about this whole thing, and you brought up a lot of information dealing with this, is the fact that really what you have here with the anti-New World Order movement, as it's called, it's connected directly to the New World Order itself. And I can't stress this enough. People have to understand that, look, these people who have resources, have money, have all this control, they're not just going to sit back and allow a real resistance organization to show up and and fight the New World Order. It, it's not that simple. So that's why they fund their own opposition movements so that people are caught basically working with an organization or with people that are not going to accomplish anything because those organizations are led by people who are actually working for them. And uh, I think what you were mentioning with the origins of the John Birch Society is very fascinating because when you take a look at the origins of that group, there are people who have links back to the Council on Foreign Relations, as you mentioned, the Federal Reserve, the Internal Revenue Service, and uh, probably a bunch of our organizations that we haven't even had the chance to dive into. But clearly, you see establishment connections with that group, and that group was really the genesis of of the modern day patriot movement as you mentioned so it's very fascinating and as i said earlier in the show this is certainly not an area that has been covered nearly enough by people who are in the so-called research community i think too many people have gotten themselves caught up in these mental boxes that um unfortunately are completely false and are put there in place so that you don't really get beyond a certain level well, what's interesting uh, about the John Burt Society and, and, and what you're talking about with them, uh, you know, having gatekeepers and having people there who are acting as a filter, allowing the information to go only so far, only up to a certain point, and then um, coming in and saying, okay, you know, that's enough. We're only going to talk about this up to here. And what, what I found in the research in John Burt Society for the film is that Robert Welch, the uh, candy magnet who had, had gotten his uh, startup money from Nelson Rockefeller, who he sold his Welch Candy Company to, he, uh, in the early 1960s, or, or middle of the or part of the 1960s, he started talking about uh, the Illuminati. And up to that point, the New World Order conspiracy had been identified as being strictly a communist conspiracy, and that was the widely held belief, and all of a sudden... Here comes, uh, uh, you know, here comes Robert Welch, and he's talking about the Illuminati. He's talking about, uh, you know, these deeper elements that control things. And as soon, within about a year as he started talking about that, here comes John McManus, uh, the Jesuit agent who comes in. And as soon as he starts coming in, there, all of a sudden there becomes a division. And then you, so you see uh, the uh, Skull and Bones, CIA, CFR, uh, Knights of Malta, William F. Buckley, Oh, I coming guess a out piece of work. <laughs> and yeah, coming out and, and denouncing the John Burt Society and saying they're, you know, they're a bad group. And then you started to have us, you had a splinter in the group. You had people who uh, believe William F. Buckley and went with that side of, of, of the party. And then you had people who splintered off and stayed with the John Burt Society. And then those people that stayed and didn't go with the establishment that Buckley was trying to set up, those were people who became deemed as, you know, uh, the conspiracy theorists and as the uh, right wing extremists and that whole end, but um, it's just, it's amazing. There there was a guy who uh, and his book's, book's very hard to find. This was another one of the more interesting things that I discovered in uh, in making this film was there was a gentleman who actually uh, on behalf of this is right prior to the Kennedy assassination on behalf of the FBI had infiltrated uh, the John Burt Society and. He wrote this book, which is very, very, very hard to find now, uh, that described all of the, the things that he saw and encountered. His name was Robert Dean, and uh, he, he, you know, he saw them openly discussing the Kennedy assassination. He named the conspirators. He named the people who were involved, and uh, John Russolo, and, and, uh, who was a John Burt Society guy at the time, and General Walker out of Dallas were, yes. were, were two of the people that he named 
And it's just interesting that this book, if you go and try to find any of uh, any of uh, Robert Dean's work, his books are very rare. They've been almost completely uh, wiped out of existence and out of print. They're expensive if you can find them at all. And uh, the reason that is, I, I believe, is because, again, in that book, in that work, he specifically says the John Burt Society and people that were involved in it were uh, single-handedly involved in the, the Kennedy assassination. So that's why you started to have the epicenter um, in ground zero for the conspiracy genre come out of the John Burt Society because they were creating their own, uh, their own cover story, essentially, but doing it under the guise of this is the real truth. This is what the New World Order is not telling you. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I talk about uh, with Alex Jones appears that uh, with the 9-11 issue, Jones may be very well be a part of uh, the same kind of operation going on there today. Yeah, it's just a, a repeat of what happened 50-something years ago, roughly. And uh, it's interesting when you take a look at all the characters that you see that have had connections to the John Burt Society that were really somewhat of a player involved at least indirectly with the Kennedy assassination we talked I mean we've talked about this on previous shows but we had H.L. Hunt the Hunt family with the uh, with those handbills they're passing out um, you had of course you mentioned Edwin Walker and what's interesting about Edwin Walker is that prior to the S prior to the uh, Kennedy assassination Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly tried to shoot him I don't know if you came across that in your research, but mm -hmm. it almost seemed like that event was staged so they could provide more credibility to the whole communist theory that they would present later on through Revlo P. Oliver. And Oliver even testified in front of the Warren Commission as a result of the articles that he wrote uh, about the Kennedy assassination, which I believe were written pretty much like a month after the Kennedy assassination before any formal investigation or inquiry could be conducted yes. so immediately he was trying to put out propaganda to to get people to say okay this is a communist plot and and that of course pretty much fit in with the official narrative so a lot of interesting stuff there with the john Burt society and the kennedy assassination no question yeah and and, and also see that connected with uh, uh as i mentioned earlier with with anthony j hilder uh who said to be the uh i mean i've heard alex jones say that he was his mentor he's uh, also said that he was alex jones's mentor and uh you know you have him being there at the the ambassador hotel the night of the uh, uh the kennedy assassination uh, the robert kennedy assassination what's interesting in the film uh actually when i used to do my show here on oracle broadcasting i uh interviewed anthony j hilder and a caller actually called in during the show and asked uh anthony j hilder about that incident about him being there and it's amazing I, and i have the clip in uh, in the CR volume two it's amazing to if you really you know, sit there and listen to that a few times and, and back it up and listen to what he says and listen to the way that he phrases the things. He never denies any involvement in it. And he changes the story several times and tries to make it sound like he was there putting out disinformation because he wanted Kennedy to lose because he knew if he won that he would be killed. Yeah. yeah the, uh, the odds of him being there in the first place for an event of that magnitude <laughs> is highly questionable. Period. And he even says at the very end of it, you know, that 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 he welcomed that opportunity to be there. And to me, that wow, yeah, that, I mean, that <laughs> would imply wouldn't, that, wouldn't that imply that, that that there was foreknowledge? Yeah, I mean, why would you welcome the opportunity to be at, at a hotel if you? I mean, because you don't know something's going to happen, but you would welcome the opportunity if you know there's going to be an event that's going to take place. Yeah, his story is is that he welcomed the opportunity to be there because uh, he was able to be there to break the story. And it's funny that one of the guys that happened to be in the room during this little press conference that he had uh, was one of the guys that Jim Garrison had uh, had brought to trial in the murder of, of Kennedy during uh, the, uh, uh, the the trial that they put Clay Shaw on, on for. And what's interesting is that guy, uh, his name is, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, he had a uh, P.O. box that... Uh, was well he tried to subpoena him and then reagan shot it down and wouldn't allow uh jim garrison to subpoena this individual and bring him to trial but one of the pieces of evidence that they had was this p.o box that uh these anti-castro cuban uh flyers and stuff had been connected to and lo and behold we find this same address stamped on the back of the 33 rpm vinyl records that myron fagan and uh 
Anthony J. Hilder put out on the Illuminati and the CFR in the 1960s. I mean, how do you explain that away? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I have to, I have to look into some of that stuff. That's fascinating. I, I hadn't heard that before. But clearly, I mean, there's some suspicious links with, with uh, this Anthony J. Hilder character and uh, Myron Fagan, especially considering that their work pretty much just came out the exact same time that the John Burt Society was, was really starting to get going and gain membership. And his involvement with the RFK assassination, I think, it, it raises just a number of questions as to this guy's credibility. And if he was Jones's mentor... I mean, come on, we, we know what Jones is all about. So this guy, obviously, I, I think there's some serious questions that need to be raised about his credibility. Well, uh, I found the guy's name here, and uh, I'll, just, I'll just read this for you. This is actually from the script of the movie, uh, The Secret Volume 2. It says, both the debate between Butler and Carlos Bringuer after the famous street confrontation between Oswald and Bringuer in New Orleans when Oswald was passing out fair play for Cuba leaflets and the assassination evening airing of the excerpts were arranged by Edward S. Butler who headed a right-wing propaganda outfit in New Orleans called the Information Council of Americas. By 1968, Butler had moved to Los Angeles, where he carried on with financial aid from Patrick J. Frawley Jr., the chief executive officer of the Stick Safety Razor Company, and Frawley generously supported hardline conservatives such as Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, and Sam Yorty, who was mayor of L.A. at the time of the RFK assassination. Frawley and Yorty belonged to the American Security Council, embodiment of the military-industrial complex, that lobbied for a bigger military establishment and ran political blacklist service for its large corporation clients. Anthony J. Hilder also claimed to have the backing of Frawley. So they, uh, you know, you had, you had this guy who not only was funding all of these big right-wing groups and was also involved in uh, uh, funding the Fair Play for Cuba leaflets that were passed out uh, in New Orleans by Oswald. They depict that in the, in the film JFK. But uh, admittedly, Anthony J. Hilder is also getting money from this guy. And he also admits in the little clip from my radio show, Lee, in the film, that he was at the Rosicrucian Center the night before the assassination. This is uh, Anthony J. Hilder saying this. And that he at was the there Rosicrucian and, Center. Yes. <laughs> and, he said, and, and he also okay. admits on my show that was here on Oracle, he says right there that he was there the night before the assassination, and he was there because Sirhan Sirhan was a Rosicrucian, and he was also there, too. You're going to you're gonna have to send me that, that MP3 file again. I, I want to I listen to that because that's fascinating. Well, I mean, you, you know, I'll, I'll send it to you, but I mean, you, you got the film now. You got the DVD, so you can so watch it. So it's all in there. Okay, so it's yeah, all in it's there. It's all in there. Okay. Yeah, it's all in there, and, but I'll send you the clip as well. But what's interesting is, Lee, is that I didn't notice at the time, 2008, when I did that show, that that was in there. And so when I got that clip and was cutting that together for the film, I went, my God, this guy just admitted pretty much that he... Uh, that he was there. He also admits that he was into hypnotism, uh, and uh, this guy, he had actually learned hypnotism from this guy who also had uh, had been uh, hanging out with Sirhan Sirhan. So, it's, so what you're saying is that he was admitting that he may have had something to do with mind control and Sirhan Sirhan, and a lot of people believe that Sirhan Sirhan was, uh, was uh, involved with MK Ultra or something along those lines. So is that pretty much what he was saying? Well, absolutely. I don't know if he was. I don't know if he was saying that he was he, that, that necessarily Wait. that he was a part of it. He wasn't saying he was a part of it. But, he's but when you listen, yeah, when you listen to what he says, he he he, he it's, it's very easy to, to you know determine from that that wait a minute, okay, why did he just say that and then say this? I mean, he's admitting that he's at the Rosicrucian Center the night before the the, the assassination, and uh, Sirhan Sirhan was a. Uh, uh, you know, at a Rosicrucian as well. He also claimed that, uh, uh, well, the hypnotist himself said that um, Hilder came to him and wanted to know about hypnotism and, and how you could control somebody. And uh, so he signed up himself and uh, his girlfriend, Hilder did, and uh, after about, I don't know, two or three classes, they just quit coming. And then one day out of the blue... Here comes Anthony J. Hilder and his uh, girlfriend, and they look out of their mind, like just crazy going nuts, muttering stuff, political this, political that. Hilder whips out a gun, a thirty-eight special, and tells uh, Gil Boyne, this Hollywood hypnotist, that he needs this gun, and he wants to give it to him as a gift for teaching him, him hypnosis, because there's going to be race, race riots 
popping off in the country soon because of an event that's about to occur. Now, that right there... To me, and this is all this I, that that information actually comes from a book that was written on the Robert F. Kennedy assassination. I, I talk about it and reference it in the book, so people can go and find that book themselves. But um, I mean, to me, right there, if, if what Gil Boyne, the hypnotist, says is true, and that was his, you know, that was his statement on the matter, I don't see why he would go through that much detail of make, making that up if it wasn't true. That would imply that just like uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh gosh, I talk about him in the film as well. Uh, the guy who made the uh, freedom to fascism, Aaron Russo. Aaron Russo, yeah. Just like Aaron Russo, supposedly, you know, hearing that there's going to be event, that same kind of a, kind of terminology, and uh, here's Hilder, you know, saying you're going to need this weapon soon because an event's going to happen, and there's going to be race wars around the country, and race riots touching off. Uh, I mean, that's that's really, really seriously, uh, pretty pretty damning stuff. But when he was on my show, I noticed immediately, and I had several people in the chat room when that show was live saying from the get-go when Hilder came on that his voice, he was using NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. You could really tell by the way he was phrasing his, uh, his statements. The first thing he says when he comes on his show, I said, Mr. Hilder, thanks for coming on the show. And he says, let's put some perfume on this particular pig. And he just, he just does this, like, this weird, strange cadence, and I really felt like you know, he's trying to hypnotize his audience. And so that doesn't help his case either, you know. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've had some people who have called into my show from time to time, and uh, I don't know what it is, but have you ever gotten that feeling when you're talking to somebody and you get this really weird vibe from them? Uh, it's had, it, well, I'll tell you, when it used to happen to me the most was when I did my show here on Oracle, uh, that, folks. That's, that, that, that's really when it happened to me all the time. Lee, I used to get people who would call in, and yeah, I would get the same thing. You would, just, you would feel as if they were... Uh, they're trying to, you know, I, I interviewed David Icke. I got to be straight up about this. I interviewed David Icke uh, back in 2008, and uh, I had a migraine headache after I a, a, after I talked to him. I felt like I was being energy vampirized. Um, exactly. And That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. I mean, I, to, to, to think that people aren't called, to say that people are calling into your show and doing that, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me, and I would say that uh, from my experience, it, I don't take calls anymore, so it doesn't happen to me, but when I used to do my show here in Oracle, yeah, it happened to me quite often. Yeah, I, well, I had one particular guy, and I was kind of wondering if, if you got that same feeling from uh, from Mr. Hilder, but I had this one guy who called into the show, and uh, apparently he was uh, uh, he used to be a guest on the Coast to Coast AM show. He, he, uh, he sent me an email about this, and, and I literally felt as, as if, like you were mentioning, that this guy was trying to suck uh, this, this energy out of my body. And I felt really weird after the call, and especially during the call. It, it just it felt so incredibly bizarre and uh i don't know it's i know i know it's hard for people to understand or, or believe what i'm talking about here but I, I can assure you that there are things like that that absolutely do happen just based off my personal experience so you know, i was kind of wondering if mr hilder gave you that that same type of vibe because it sounded like he was doing some weird stuff on the broadcast that you did with him i didn't feel it affecting me per se as i was doing the, the interview and as he was talking to him, i didn't really feel it affecting me i did kind of feel a couple of times during the show like um uh well i well, let me take that back now that i'm now that you asked me i guess i thinking about it i didn't really i, I didn't really dawn on me but now that you say that i do remember during the broadcast lee while he was talking uh getting drowsy and kind of feeling like i was nodding out i mean I, i've never gotten that feeling before on doing radio ever but I kind of felt as if, you know, and that's kind of how you get when you're being put in a trance, when you're being hypnotized, you know, you're like nodding out. You're going into a trance. So, yeah, I mean, now that you mention it, um, I did kind of feel uh, not right. But listen, man, he was saying some some crazy stuff to us off air. We talked to him off air, Hilder and my sister talked to him. He was talking about like like producing and working with the Wu-Tang Clan and like uh, all this crazy <laughs> weird stuff. The Wu-Tang Clan, that's funny. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. I, I'm not making that up. He said he was producing the Wu-Tang Clan, and he said that he wrote, uh, there's a song that he wrote that was like the intro song to the movie I Am Legend with Will Smith. Yeah, I remember and, you mentioned uh, that. Yeah. And, and I, I just, I, it, that's true. I actually looked into that, and yeah, that, that is true. Well, well, see, I mean, that, I mean, don't you find that a little bit interesting that, you know, again, here's these, all we always have these connections to uh, Hollywood and the mob and to Rome and, and, and to the priest class and all this stuff. And, uh, and that just, you, you, you see that all the way through uh, the music industry, the film industry. I know that uh, Alex Constantine's done a lot of books and stuff on that, on that subject. People can look into that. 
But um, I mean, that to me was just at the time I didn't know as much about the Hilder stuff and didn't know as much about the really the deeper connections of the, the CMP and not just the CMP, but uh, the whole truth movement and conspiracy genre and the John Burt Society and all that stuff itself, which is really the, the bigger part of it. That's what I tell people now is that the CMP is important because it's a secretive group. And obviously, uh, whatever it is they do talk about, they, they, they take drastic measures to not let us know what that is. But uh, really, the bigger element of this whole thing is that the entire genre or you know movement of conspiracy anti-New World Order stuff was founded on the basis of psyops and disinformation. That's a fact. It's really mind blowing when you start looking at all this, but uh, my God, I mean, when you consider that a lot of these people have connections to Hollywood, I mean, if if what Hitler is saying about the Wu Tang Clan and all that stuff, um, if all that is true, and, and I don't doubt that, uh, that it, it's well, I, I pretty much believe that's true based upon what we've yeah. seen from people like Jones, because Jones, of course, has connections to Charlie Sheen. He openly brags about how he's got all these buddies. From Hollywood, and he's appeared in a couple motion pictures. Even his wife, well, I guess girlfriend at the time, but his wife has said that he is a very good actor. There was some video footage. This is before he he did his uh, supposed infiltration of the Grove, and yeah. uh, you see the clip of of her saying that, "Oh, Alex is such a great actor." Well, I mean, these connections are very bizarre. And Hollywood, of course, I've talked about on this show quite frequently. I mean. Hollywood is just a cesspool of filth and corruption, and they put out so much mind control, it'll make your head spin. So for anybody to have connections to Hollywood, I'm talking about like real deep connections, you have to ask some more questions as to their credibility. Well, I, you know, I didn't really get into uh, all the Jones connections to the Hollywood stuff as much as I would have wanted to in the film. Um, I left a lot of that out strictly because... I mean, you already had almost an hour of this guy, as you were saying, Lee. It's just you know you could do three or four or five hours on it, but uh, right, yeah, th th that's the, that, that's the thing that I found is is that um, the connections to uh, Adnan Kashiogi and uh, his setting up of all these CIA front companies to uh, funnel money for black operations such as nine eleven and others, and uh, him being the the godfather of the whole infomercial, uh, you know, miracle product. Uh, you know, standard operating procedure that GCN operates under and seeing the fact that, you know, he he's somebody who prided himself on his connections to rock stars and movie stars and all this stuff as well. And uh, just all the way across the board, the uh, all the way to the him, Alan Jones being on The View, you know, defending Charlie Sheen. I mean, that was a huge part of the operation. So uh, no matter what field these guys are operating in, it seems that they bounce around between whatever particular genre they're doing at the time. Sometimes the focus will be on politics. Sometimes the focus is on media, culture, entertainment. But um, it, it, they, they seem to use a lot of the same players for various parts of the operation. And I think that Jones and, uh, of course, Sheen, I mean, the, the fact that he kept the Sheen name alone, uh, people never really understand the reason why Emilio Estevez, his name is Emilio Estevez, and uh, not Emilio Sheen. That's because the Sheen name is literally the name that they give their Jesuit operators. It's 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 a last name that was chosen because, of course, Martin Sheen uh, and the the, uh, the Jesuit guy who he uh, he took the name from that was, was his mentor. But that's what that signifies is is that by keeping that last name, that yes, I'm a part of this Jesuit conspiracy, and I'm one of these operators. And of course. Uh, I guess Emilio Estevez said he didn't want to have anything to do with that. He just wanted to be in Mighty Ducks and be left alone. Yeah, I guess so. Well, yeah. Well, well of course, tra <laughs> uh, what's his name? Uh, Martin Sheen. Well, it, his real name is actually Ramon Estevez. That's his right. real name. And and yeah, he got his he got the Sheen name from from that character that was on TV back in the 1950s, Fulton J. Sheen. And uh, you can who was I'm, like an Alex Jones type guy of his of his time. Um. Well, I think you're I think you're talking about. Coughlin, is that who you're talking well, about? Coughlin was too. Yeah, Coughlin was too. But he was. I mean, he was into. They said that the Sheen guy was into preaching conspiracy theories and stuff as well, right? I'm not sure. I haven't really done as much research into Sheen. All I know is that he was basically a televangelist back in the 1950s, right. Catholic, of course, and uh, he was one of the first people that actually uh, adopted that format. I mean, of course, but back in the like the 80s, 90s, you, you saw that stuff all around, but. But way back when, in the 50s, uh, that was a relatively new concept to, to be preaching religious beliefs 
over television. So, um, you know, he was definitely a very influential figure uh, during the 1950s. Uh, it had, right. had very it, good ratings on TV the, Yeah, proselytizing using electronic media, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's similarities between what he was doing back then and what you see happening in the now, what you can call the internet age, where you have the same type of deal happening, only it's on a different platform. Yeah, it's, un it's unbelievable, and uh, that continues to be the model that they use to this day, and, and it works. People, people get bought into, people are just so used to the, um, you know, sort of that celebrity presentation of things that, uh, you know, it seems to be that's, that, that's what people respond to. So that's why you have Jones with the, you know, the, the screens behind him and all that stuff, because they're sort of playing into that mainstream culture of what people believe uh, is, you know, real information. Well, sure. It's interesting when you take a look at some of the presentations that Jones puts out, and you see that he's using the same type of graphics and the same type of uh, of stuff that you see on the corporate control media, especially Fox News. And I remember one time he was mentioning on his show that that uh, that yeah, I mean, we use mind control in our audience, but it's to unlock their minds, and that's why we put all these flashing graphics up there and whatnot. And no, it's literally, he's trying to hypnotize his audience into believing what he's saying by putting all those flashing graphics and all these things up on the screen. Um, but he said that he was doing it for good purposes, which, of course, is a big joke. I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, honestly, I mean, would you be trying to control somebody's mind for good purposes? Uh, anybody who's doing that, I, I would say, is not doing that for, <coughs> for a good reason. They're doing that because they have an agenda. So I don't know. What are your well, thoughts me, on that? That's kind of right along with the, with the same thing that, uh, well, there's, I have the clip in the Cigarette Volume 2 where he's talking about, and I know you've seen this clip before, Lee, but and talked about here on your show, but uh, he, he he's talking about, you know, folks, you know, Glenn Beck, I'm producing 60% of Glenn Beck's show now, folks. They take, you know, 60% of what I, I talk about on my show is literally going to be on Glenn Beck's show the next week, and he's, folks, he's wearing the same clothes as I am, and they're, he's putting, <laughs> he, he, right. he's trying to make it appear that they're stealing all this stuff from him on the underground and making it mainstream, but yet, you know, Odie starts talking about the little rule books, you know, which he doesn't talk about the Heritage Foundation producing those and all this. I'm sitting there going, my God, you're saying that, uh, you know, Dick Army puts out these, these rule books, Glenn Beck puts them out, and you put them out, but that's a coincidence, and these guys who are bad are copying you, and you're a good guy? That's such a lie. I can't believe he thinks people are that stupid. I mean, that's a clear connection. He's sitting there basically admitting and showing you his connections to the establishment of right wing and and the whole uh, the whole party, but yet trying to put up this front that somehow they're stealing his thunder and they're stealing what he's doing. I mean, it's genius, but it's all bullcrap. Uh, it's it's unbelievable. And, and plus, also remember the whole Deborah Medina fiasco. I'm sure I'm sure you yeah. covered it. Yeah, where you basically have Glenn Beck attacking Medina on one side the nine eleven issue being too close to 9-11 truth, and then Jones gets up on his show in an angry tirade and says, I can't believe that Deborah Medina disrespected 9-11 truthers or something to that effect. And, you know, I mean, regardless of what you think about Deborah Medina, I think she was legitimately an outsider. And that's why both Beck and Jones attacked her using that issue. And it's clear that Beck and Jones are working together. I mean, it's completely insane. And, and even, I, I'm sure you heard this clip, but did you hear the clip when when Beck was making fun of Jones uh, about his Charlie Sheen interview, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I mean why, why would why would Beck be playing that? I mean, why would he? Why would we be doing that uh, unless he was engaging in some sort of guerrilla underground marketing campaign for Jones? Because it seems like that every so often the mainstream corporate media puts out something that will advertise indirectly for Jones. I mean, it's clearly being done by design. They do it all the time. Well, he's doing voiceovers on on regular TV channels now and stuff. Jones, yeah, is. yeah, with that. Um, oh, what's that commercial? The the End of America commercial, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's unreal. I mean, it, it's totally unreal. Then he admits that he's got high level sources at Fox News. He said that countless times. Um, he's been on with Geraldo Rivera a few times. Which, by the way, don't you have a clip with Geraldo Rivera in in, in the, the Secret Right Volume Two where he's interviewing? Ted Gunderson, Michael Aquino, some uh, some Jesuit priest of some kind, and yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I'm looking at all these people. And I'm saying you gotta be freaking kidding me. I mean, all these people. I mean, these guys are up there talking together. about Satan worshippers. They are the Satan worshippers. 
But yeah, it, it was like one big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was a mind-blowing clip, man. It was. I mean, because you're sitting there going, I mean, that is, is another one of those classic. To me, it was. It went right along with the clip that was in Volume 1 where you know, from, uh, you know, remember that Crossfire clip with Larry McDonald and uh, right. uh, Pat Buchanan? And, I mean, that, that clip was one of those classic moments of, you know, three gentlemen who obviously run in the same circles, but who are making it appear that they're somehow against each other. And then to have that same type of thing be played out in that Geraldo clip with uh, Ted Gunderson, Michael Aquino, and a Jesuit priest, all three on stage at the same time. Uh, I mean, it's, it was just one of those mind-blowing things where I went, my God, they're, they're just throwing it right in our face here. Ted Gunderson, the controlled uh, you know, agent that was working uh, to, well, from what, what I understand, from people that I've talked about, Ted Gunderson was, has, was working all the way up until the time of his death to try to uh, name people in the truth movement, patriot movement, as domestic terrorists. And uh, right as soon as I released the secret volume two, we were talking about Hilder a little bit ago. Hild, right as soon as the movie dropped and people were watching it on pay-per-view uh, that I had it for a little while, all of a sudden, Andy J. Hilder, who hasn't put out anything new, and I don't know how in years, hadn't heard anything out of this guy. All of a sudden, as soon as Secret Act 2 comes out, he comes out with this new conspiracy theory with no evidence to back it up whatsoever, saying that Ted Gunderson was poisoned <laughs> and was killed by somebody. No evidence to back it up whatsoever, but I just thought the timing of him coming out with that information right as this movie was coming out uh, was a little mind-blowing. But going back to, you were talking about Jones, you, you said something about Jones saying that he had high-level sources at uh, Fox News or something like that? Yeah, at Fox News, yeah. Well, that's what I, that's what I was hinting at earlier, and uh, that's why I, 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 I tend to, to think that his high-level source at Fox News is probably more than likely Paul Vallali. Because Paul Vallali, uh, again, he's the senior military analyst of Fox News, he uh, headed up all of the MK Ultra and all of the uh, psyop, psyop operations in, in the 1970s. In fact, I've got uh, I, I've got some stuff here from from the script on it, and uh, they wrote this uh, this I guess it was a paper. It was called Mind War, and it was written by Michael Aquino and uh, Paul Vallali, and uh, they specifically talk about. Uh, Mind war being a permanent state of strategic psychological warfare against populations of friend and foe nations alike. In its strategic context, mind war must reach out to friends, enemies, and neutrals alike across the globe through the media possessed by the United States, which have the capabilities to reach virtually all people on the face of the earth. These media are, of course, the electronic media, television, and radio, state-of-the-art developments in satellite communication, video recording techniques, and laser and optical transmissions of broadcast make possible a penetration of the minds of the world such as would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. Above all else, uh, Michael Aquino argues, mind war must target the population of the United States. And people can go and Google that. Uh, Paul Vallali, again, the, set, the senior military analyst at Fox News, co-wrote these documents. And they literally talk about using the new media and electronic media to convince the populations of the United States that there's an outside threat to them that they can band together in defeat if they band together in defeat to take action. And in those mind war documents, they specifically talk about information warfare. That's what they call it. And that's where the term info war came from that Jones used. And one of the logos, and it looks remarkably similar to, similar to one of Alex Jones's info wars logos. So I was, you know, I was sitting here looking at this going, my God, um, you, you, the, the argument that Jones is part of this ongoing psychological operation campaign is, I don't want to give away too much here on the show because I want people to watch the film and see all this information in the film, but, um, you know, th this idea that we, you know, we're going to convince populations of the United States that there's this outside threat, you know, a shadow enemy, the New World Order. Uh, we're not going to really give the people all the details on really who that is and really what those people make up and really who's running it. But we'll just whip them up in such a fervor to unite against this enemy that we'll have them right where we want them and we can do anything we want to them. And, uh, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Lee, but that to me sounds like the definition of Alex Jones to, to, to a T. Oh, absolutely. I, I think uh, what you described is definitely the Alex Jones operation. And, you know, it's one of those things where uh, when you start connecting all the dots uh, with different things that he's been involved in, it becomes very clear that there's something not right with this guy. And uh, at this point, I mean, I think 
there's so much evidence. It's overwhelming, especially when you look at the gun rights rally incident where he disrupted uh, a gun rights rally. That might have been staged, but he played a big part in that whole thing. Uh, you take a look at the Democrat National Convention, that staged event between him and Michelle Malkin, where he tried to start absolutely a riot. that was staged. That was absolutely staged. Yeah, all these events clearly carefully staged because Michelle Malkin, come on, she works for Fox News as a contributor, and then Jones uh, appears all over Fox News, brings on people from Fox News onto his show frequently. I mean, all of this stuff is completely staged and staged for different purposes. So uh, I think absolutely when you take a look at all the evidence and we take a look at his track record, and especially InfoWars, I mean, come on. What were the odds that you would see this guy from the Temple of Set who worked as a lieutenant colonel in the Army involved in psychological warfare ops? Are you telling me that Alex Jones, InfoWars.com, and the connection back to this document talking about information warfare and InfoWar, where it actually originated from, to say that that is some sort of Crazy coincidence, I think, is ridiculous, especially considering the footprint that he has and the amount of people that know who he is and the amount of people that he is able to reach because of the corporate control media pretty much assisting him uh, with that. So, obviously, there's some very interesting questions here, and I think anybody who continues to defend Alex Jones, I, I think there's a real problem there. Yeah, and, and you know, with, with Aquino also, I mean, you look at all these other connections that we, we talked about in Volume 1 of The Secret Right and, and what you've talked about here on your show as well, but you look at, uh, you know, Larry Pratt and Pat Buchanan and, and uh, Jones's connection to those guys and, and, and their connections to Iran-Contra, uh, and there again, we have Adnan Kashiogi and Michael Aquino right in the middle of that. I mean, Aquino was taking uh, the money from the, this, these sex slave operations and these um, uh, trafficking, human trafficking things that he was doing and funneling that money uh, from the CIA to Adnan Kashiogi, who was then providing the weapons uh, during Iran-Contra. I, I mean, it's, it, it's unbelievable, and uh, I, I really detail, and again, I don't want to give, uh, I'm really trying to give people as much information as I can without uh, telling them everything that's in the film, because I want people to watch it, but uh, uh, we get into more detail of all this stuff in the film, and you get to see the pictures, but I was, I was really blown away at uh, uh, the Kashiogi stuff and his connections to because uh, Jones tried to, we have the clip in there of Jones trying to say, uh, well, they say Kashiogi is connected to, they say he's somehow connected to the to uh, to Israel and all this. Blah blah. blah. Tried, it basically says something of uh, Kashiogi being connected to, to Israelis or something is preposterous. And then uh, you know you find that in about two point five seconds that he gets all his money from uh, Carl Khan, who's one of the biggest financiers. Of uh, of everything, I mean, he gave a hundred million dollars to uh, Kashiogi's Genesis Intermedia company. Carla Khan is, is a Zionist Jewish financier. He's one of the most feared men in finance up there with all the Rockefellers and everything else. And uh, he gave a hundred million dollars, like it wasn't anything, to Kashiogi's uh, Genesis Intermedia company, which then went to fund John Gray's book, "Men Are from Mars, Women Are from Venus." He then took money from the sales of that and funded Barry Zwicker's 9-11 documentary, which was actually the first documentary on 9-11, uh, to which Alex Jones later tried to claim that he had made the first documentary, but he also ended up having uh, both Barry Zwicker and John Gray on his show at some point. So there's when you look into that and you watch the film, you'll see more details on that. I'm just really scratching the surface for you here for the radio show. But, um, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable, folks. And then you look at uh, Cascio's connection to the 9-11 hijackers, his setting up these business fronts that are exactly to a T, the model that the Genesis Communications Radio Network has ran on. Um, I mean, he's got all kinds of businesses that have that same exact model. Uh, it's like a pyramid scheme uh, model of, of people selling precious metals and miracle creams and all this other stuff. And uh, again, not a coincidence, not a coincidence that that's the same model that Jones and GCN uses. And that's how they've uh, funded these black operations and provided disinformation. That's how Jones and other people get these insider sources. They leak information to them. They tell them, OK, there's going to be a big operation like a 9-11 three months from now. Um, and then but they don't give many specifics or any details. Then that person has plausible deniability because they just say, well, it's my confidential source. And so since I'm media, I don't have to give up my source because it's confidentiality. So then Jones goes on his uh, radio show in July of 2001 and says, you know, 
there's going to be an attack and all this stuff, and then it happens, and then he gets to prop himself up as the father of the 9-11 truth community, especially within a month after they uh, eliminated Bill Cooper. Right. And then the next, th the next thing you know, here we have this, this model of Alex Jones selling products and creams and golds and all the rest of this stuff under the guise of providing the truth and providing the real information. But really what he's doing is providing a smokescreen and using fear to sell products, which then launders the money that goes on to fund other operations like 9-11 and other things that the, the priest class wants to do. So uh, absolutely, Cascio, he's one of the biggest players in that. And uh, his model for setting up operations extends perfectly into the model that GCN and Alex Jones uses. Well, yeah, Cash Yogi, this guy was also connected to the assassination of Princess Di. At least I consider it an assassination, the official story. Says yeah, Dodi so. Fayette was, his, was yeah. his nephew, yeah. Right, so uh, that's another interesting link right there. So clearly a very intriguing fella, to, to say the least, and somebody that people should definitely look into. But, I mean, man, you know, it, there are just so many connections here back to the establishment and back to the power structure. It'll make your head spin, and... You know, it, it just goes to show you that literally the alternative media, for the most part, when you look at the major figureheads, uh, these people who are given prominence, and there are a lot of people. It seems like that there's one person for almost every possible genre or every possible point of view that you could potentially have in the alternative media, and they're set up and put there in place on purpose because they know there are people that would come along that would research the same type of stuff and start talking about similar types of information. So they intentionally put their gatekeepers there so that people will fall into following those people instead of somebody who is out, outside of the power structure. And, uh, of course, I think Jones is one of the biggest players involved with this, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. Well, another fascinating thing for me is, has been uh, to see how these, uh, these people have used a lot of the same terminology um, well, for instance, in the film we have, uh, and I've heard you mention this uh, on the show before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, or a month or so ago, you were talking about the clip that I have in the Cigarette Volume 2 of the, uh, Pedro Rupe, the former black pope, uh, where he's talking about addressing a new world order and all that. And, right. uh, one of the clips, one of the clips from the news archives that we got in the film, uh, they, they there's a quote in there where they says, Pe uh, Pedro Rupe says that, um, uh, violent, conflict is sometimes justified in the face of of tyranny and yes. uh you have Bill, you have barry goldwater at the uh uh republican national convention saying you know uh what was it uh, extremism in the in the defense of liberty is no vice and he was saying yeah. that in response to something that nixon had said and then you see uh you know that, that sort of be the same motto and credo for the Patriot Movement, the Truth Movement, you know, when the when the ballot box doesn't work anymore, we're going to use the cartridge box, and uh, you know, when violent, when uh, uh, peaceful resistance fails, violent revolution's the only answer. I mean, th that ideology and that mindset came from the Jesuits, one hundred percent, for hundreds of years, and they have been the ones from the onset who have um, really seeded. The various revolutions, phony, uh, well, pretty much all the revolutions. I mean, they're all, none of these things have really ever sprang up from the people. They've all sprang up from from things that these people have cooked up. But uh, that clip with the uh, former Jesuit priest in there, Alberto, uh, Alberto Rivera, where he's talking about, you know, the Jesuits planning, being the planners and being the intellectual mindset behind these events. And they uh, basically write the script for an event because of their, you know, the Jesuit education is supposed to be the best. And that's one of the things they teach these guys. They teach them how to use poisons. They use them, they teach them warfare of all kinds, but not warfare. So they'll be involved in it directly. Uh, but warfare for planning these big operations that, you know, low level operators and grunts and everything else actually carry out. So that to me is one of the biggest admissions for uh, for the information, when you really do the research, you really do find that, don't you, Lee? Well, absolutely. And, and even in recent history, you take a look at El Salvador, and you'll see that even just Central America in general during this time frame, you can do a, a, an archive search in the news and just look up Jesuits, and you will see that there was a great deal of Jesuit involvement in Central America in 
these revolutions that occurred and and pretty much what they were doing is they're promoting this marxist theology or uh, well it, it was called I'm searching for the term it's called liberation theology and, and this yeah. theology is basically a, a combination of catholicism and marxism so really what you had is you had them using this ideology to try to stir up trouble and to create a potential civil unrest or even a civil war in these countries. And there was a particular incident that occurred where uh, a bunch of these Jesuits were actually killed. And they are probably killed because people found out that they were conspiring to create trouble. And uh, that's just one example. I mean, you've seen Jesuit involvement in uh, a number of other wars and conflicts and other things that have occurred over the past 200 plus years and even longer. And even John Adams, he was quoted, the second president of the United States, he talked about how the Jesuits deserve eternal damnation in hell. And you can look up that quote. Um, <laughs> so, um, regardless of what you believe about John Adams, that was an actual quote. And it shows you that these people that prescribed this organization have been troublemakers for a very long time. And uh, I think their involvement uh, led to the fact that they were suppressed for 50 years back in the 1700s. You know, yep. It's all very interesting. Well, I also, I think what, the other thing is, you know, it's just like you have these, uh, a lot of these guys who were involved in the John Burt Society and CFR and all this stuff, all these, you know, especially during the uh, McCarthy era where everybody was running around calling everybody a commie. And then you find out a lot of these guys actually are communists. I mean, you know, yeah. they're running oh, around yeah. calling everybody that. And a lot of them actually were. And there's a story that, that uh, uh, came out today from uh, the Daily Beast that is entitled Santorum's Communist Clan. Did you see that? <laughs> no, I didn't get a chance to see that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, oh, it's greatness, man. I'll have to send it to you. It's all about the history of uh, uh, Rick Santorum's family that came from dun, 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 northern Italy and how this entire clan of Rick Santorum's family were all communists from, from, from Italy. <laughs> I mean, on top of what we already know about this guy. Well, yeah, Santorum's, of course, Council for National Policy. I think he's Catholic also. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's just uh, he's just not phony. But and there's also some talk that, uh, well, he, of course, he was a senator from Pennsylvania. There was actually I haven't researched this, but I heard uh, oh, it was on our show on this network. I can't remember which one. Ah, oh, jeez, I, 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 it escapes me. But basically, uh, of course, you had the whole Sandusky uh, incident that occurred down there with right. the uh, pedophilia and whatnot. And supposedly uh, through this man by the name of Bill English, who I believe was either. Uh, he was a politician of some kind, but he had connections back to Santorum. And Bill English apparently has some connections to uh, some bizarre behavior uh, down there that may have been linked to this whole Sandusky uh, pedophilia ring or whatever hmm. is, is going on down there. Um, you know, just very interesting stuff. So, yeah, Rick Santorum, of course, is not established with crony. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> But my point is, my point is, is that you know, you, 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 just like you were saying, though, you, you know, a lot of these guys who have been, uh, you know, calling these, be, calling whatever people these names, they actually are that because again, the, they're the, these Jesuits, are, they're all about deceit and they're all about cognitive dissonance in uh, creating fear and panic about something, and then meanwhile, um, operating in the back. Well, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, the the whole Star Wars analogy. You know, you've got. Uh, you know, the emperor acting like he's on, on, on that side and the behind closed doors. He's, you know, he's working for the, uh, for the empire against the Republic. I mean, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. It's just a microcosm of that. And, uh, this is how these guys operate. But I was, I was really, uh, just fascinated with how much, uh, and how long these operations for, you know, supremacy of, religion and the priest class have been going on and it extends throughout our entire history on this planet yeah for thousands of years you've seen these battles between these various abrahamic religions especially and uh that of course i mean you can look at the crusades that's one of the uh, more interesting time frames in which you see these battles uh, of these people that are going back and forth trying to prove that their religion is better than somebody else's religion but it's really it's all being orchestrated all of these divisions are, are clearly being orchestrated and, you know, what's interesting, when you brought up communism, it's fascinating. When you look into Joseph McCarthy, he went to a Jesuit school, and he was also buddies yep. with, um, with a, a Jesuit by name of, oh, what was his name? Edmund Walsh, I believe it was. And Edmund Walsh, going off my memory, I'll double-check this when we go for a break,
But um, Edmund Walsh was involved at Georgetown University, which is another Jesuit-based school. And Edmund Walsh was also, of course, a Jesuit. So uh, when you take a look at those connections between McCarthy and this Jesuit Edmund Walsh, and you see how McCarthy was, of course, the principal figure involved in this whole anti-communist rhetoric that uh, swept the nation in the 1950s, you start to see how uh, there is this overarching ideology from the Jesuits in which they try to create trouble in uh, any number of methods uh, that they can employ. So uh, just just like that example, you see also a parallel example with El Salvador and the liberation theology. They use whatever theology or, uh, or whatever type of uh, mindset they can use to stir up trouble and to get people mad and to get people to do things they might otherwise not do. And I think you're seeing the same type of thing with the Patriot Movement and Jones and, and all that. It's all connected. And it, it just it's the same thing, only it's happening at different periods of time. Now we're just seeing a different iteration of the same thing. Well, it, it, what, the, the thing that, that Jones represents, it, I think a lot of people who, who are researching him sometimes don't uh, really think about, but it's the truth is that you know, there always seems to be, uh, just as you were mentioning earlier with the, uh, with the guy Sheen, who was, a, a, you know, the first, one of the first televangelists and using the, the new media platform of television at that time to proselytize and to, and to preach from, and that the bloody pulpit being this new electronic media. Well, I think that uh, since the rise of the Internet era, they needed, they needed someone in that vein to sort of be the, the, uh, the figurehead uh, of the the new electronic media and the internet media age and stuff that was coming out, and someone who was going to be um, sort of their main guy and their main gatekeeper for the internet. And I think that Jones uh, undoubtedly is that guy because, um, as you and I have talked about many times on on both of our shows, you, we, he starts. The, you know, that's why most people when they get into this stuff find Alex Jones first because he has created this little universe where certain topics and certain keywords go directly to his articles first, and then you go to look for certain other pieces of information, but then you don't find things on it. So what happens is is that people find the Alex Jones stuff first and more often because it's designed for you to, and you find that, but then when you go and look and you don't find other subjects connected to Alex Jones, um, it starts to create this cognitive dissonance in people sometimes where they think that because they didn't find a piece of that information um, with his stamp of approval on it, that it must not be true because if it was true, he would be talking about it. And uh, that's, that's a very dangerous thing, and it's very real, and I've seen it happen with people uh, hundreds of times, Lee, but in the course of doing my radio show and doing this work uh, for the past four or five years, and I know you've seen it as well. That's one of the, I, I think we're, we're able to now identify for years, you and I, I think we're probably screaming on our radio shows about Jones and this, that, and the other, but I think now more than ever, you and I and the rest of everybody else, we really have more of a uh, of a real understanding and a real explanation for exactly what it is Jones and these other operators are really up to and doing, and, and I'm excited to be uh, discussing that here with you in detail tonight. Oh yeah, absolutely, and we'll go for a, a quick break in a minute or so. I know we've been talking for a while, but uh, what, what I find interesting is that Two or three years ago, uh, when I first started really figuring out that th there's a problem with this guy, um, if you even mentioned that there might have been a problem with him or Ron Paul or anything like that, it, you would get all these people screaming at you and yelling at you, saying that you're this, you're that, or, or you're disinformation. But now, it, it seems as if that people are starting to slowly recognize that there is a really, uh, I would say, a, uh, a profound issue w with this individual. A and now, when I do my show, I rarely get people who disagree uh, with my stance on Jones. I mean, I got some people that still disagree, but uh, I can tell you the percentage of people that disagree uh, compared to the people who agree, um, I mean, there's far more people that agree that there's something wrong with Jones than uh, the people who disagree. So, I think we've definitely made some serious progress on that front, and uh, I think more and more people are going to find your work, my work, as we go on into the future, as as this guy continues to expose himself. I mean, look at all the things that he's done over the past couple of years. It's just been insane, uh, the amount of stuff that he's done to 
really out himself as an operative. But it, it's just crazy. Do you have any final thoughts before we go to a quick break? Yeah, you know, I want I want to say from what you're, you made some great points there, and I think that that's really the key um, is 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 just not to, to to not stop digging and to keep looking into this stuff for yourself. And I think that's what people have um, really done a lot more now than they used to because they see that it's you know it's not just about Alex Jones or it's not just about the Council for National Policy. Uh, those are just two parts of this uh, of this whole big thing. But um, when you really dig in, in deep to this and you really take the time to want to know the information, a lot of people just flat don't want to know it, so they don't look into it. But, uh, yeah, you know, like you said, it's, it's really, really, really uh, very plain and in your face once you take the time to look at it. But as, as we know and as we've discussed here, the, uh, with the whole genre being controlled from day one and being set up day one as a, uh, as a gatekeeping thing, uh, that hasn't happened, and so hopefully, as you said, um, you know that's what people will take away the most from our work is um, the ability to to look into stuff for yourself and to really continue to dig and to see that if you just don't give up and you keep looking, you keep digging, eventually you'll have a better understanding about stuff that just a short time ago you had no idea. You know? Oh, absolutely, and uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, separate both of us uh, was when we first started digging into this so when we first got on air and started doing websites and things like that, is that we were constantly researching and looking at things. And it just naturally led us to look at this aspect of the control system. And we started looking at it, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I think we've covered a lot of that in the first hour of the show. But um, Josh, we're going to take a quick break because I know, I'm sure you could probably use a break. I could use a drink of water myself. So Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick five to seven minute break. We're going to play some music and then we're going to come back and we'll continue the show. My guest, Josh Reeves. Again, check out his website at theglobalreality.com and you can check out his movie, The Secret Right Volume 2, which is on sale at that website. So definitely check that out. All right, folks, I'm going to play some tunes and we will be right back in a little bit. Just bear with me while I load up some music. Got to find some music to play, but bear with me. I'll find something in a second. And yes, we will be right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the broadcast. Let me just the music here. There we go. All right. Well, we're back. I'm joined here with my guest, Josh Reeves. Again, the website, theglobalreality.com. And you can check out his new film, The Secret Right, Volume 2, which gets into a lot of these fake patriot shills, gets into a number of different topics of conversation. The council for National Policy, the John Birch Society, the Jesuit Order, the Temple of Set, Michael Aquino, and uh, that whole situation, which uh, I definitely want to explore in greater detail with Josh. But uh, it's just a lot of interesting information. I haven't had a chance to watch the entire film, but uh, there's definitely some good information in it from what I've seen so far. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. And uh, Josh, going back to the movie, and uh, I guess we'll explore this now because in my research, I was very fascinated about Michael Aquino and the uh, Presidio Army base and how essentially you had this scandal that took place there where a bunch of children who were sent to this daycare center were raped or sodomized. All this horrible stuff happened to them. And Michael Aquino appeared to be at the very center of this. There was some sort of investigation and got covered up. And uh, it looked like there's some really powerful people that really tried to put a kibosh to any sort of exposure of what was actually taking place at, at that particular location. In fact, uh, there was even uh, a year later, uh, they closed down that particular base, which was very interesting. Um, in your research, can you get into uh, what you found about Michael Aquino, the Presidio Army base, and this connection to what appears to be this gigantic pedophilia ring. Well, absolutely, and um, he had uh, Michael Aquino had set up his um, basically his whole operation for the the temple, the Satanic Temple of Set, with uh, his wife, who's <laughs> this is not. I'm not I promise you, I'm making this up. Her name's Lilith. Uh, I just, <laughs> <it's> just <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> it's like a big joke. I, I know it's just hilarious. Uh, yeah, I, it is a big joke to these people. And I just crack up every time I see that. And there's, there's footage of her in the film and she just looks like 
she literally looks like the, the freaking undead. I mean, there's just there's no other way of putting it. And um, they had set up their uh, their temple of set at uh, at their house in uh, in Russian Hill, which is right there uh, in, below the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, where, where the Presidio military base is. And uh, there was a uh, apparently at this house there was a, a, a Baptist minister and um, uh, his name was uh, oh, where where is it? I had it here. Uh, he was uh, oh there it is um, essentially he was a guy who was uh, uh, Gary Hambright and he was a former Baptist minister and he was indicted in September 1987 on charges that he uh, committed lewd and lascivious acts with six boys and four girls the thing about it is there's always it seems to be people who are low level people who are nabbed for this stuff and the high level people go on uh, you know, untouched, but yeah, they, they, uh, th there was a four year old that had been brutally raped multiple, uh, multiple times. And, uh, all this was, was done at the headquarters of the, uh, satanic uh, temple of set. And of course, Kathy O'Brien, who wrote the book, uh, transformation of America also, uh, backed up a lot of this information. And, uh, she quoted, it was quoted in her book several times saying that, uh, that he was the head of uh, uh, of all of this mind control stuff. Um, in fact, I have the quotes here. According to uh, Kathy O'Brien, one of our primary mind control programmers was Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. He was the Psychological Warfare Division of the U.S. Army and founder of the occult Temple of Set that is proliferating on our military bases under the guise of a religion. He doesn't have any religious beliefs that I ever saw, but he used occultism as a trauma base for mind control. The only satanic power I ever experienced by Aquino was in the form of a stun gun. The high voltage that he administered to both my daughter and I compartmentalized memories of programs for later access by certain government leaders and CIA-sanctioned drug lords that had the codes, keys, and triggers to that particular program. So um, there was also a guy by the name of Paul Bonacci, who uh, we have several clips up in the film, who actually won a civil case uh, Michael Quinn has never come, uh, has, has never uh, been uh, brought to trial in any of this stuff, and he denies up and down the wall his involvement in any of it. And uh, but yet there was a one million dollar uh, judgment awarded to Paul Bonacci, who was in prison for uh, supposedly molesting somebody. But he he went on on the record, and the judge believed him, and he passed a lie detector test, and he said uh, absolutely that. Uh, Michael Aquino was involved in the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh and that they used Paul Bonacci to lure him into the car and that he was sold into, uh, into the sex trade. And we get into that and uh, we get into that stuff with, uh, with, with the whole uh, stuff with Johnny, uh, Johnny Gosh and Jeff Gannon as well. But what it shows here is, Lee, is that uh, these guys actually not only enjoy this, but it almost seems to be a requisite for being in this club. You you almost have to absolutely be um, a sadistic pedophile. And uh, w what's funny is is that th these guys appear to part of this. They were it was an ongoing psychological warfare operation. But the other part of it was is that they were using people who were involved in this stuff who actually enjoy doing it, like uh, the guy who was the uh, uh, Dr. Edward Teller. The father of the hydrogen bomb, he was also on the board of uh, governors for uh, the high-level tip-top of the Council for National Policy Pyramid when it was formed. He's the guy that got the uh, uh, patent from Arco Oil from Bernard Eastland to develop HARP for military purposes, and he was known to have stables of boys and girls, and uh, Bonacci uh, testified to that as well, and that's what they would do. They would, they would t you know, these guys were into pedophile sadistic behavior but on top of being into it they were also using it for their mind control and mk ultra process i mean that's to me that's what's so sick about it because it's not just that these guys are are doing this uh for these military purposes and these mind control programs but they're also being involved in it because they just flat enjoy it. it's pretty sick yeah and there's all sorts of evidence that this is a really widespread thing i mean it, there's even uh, of course, I'm sure you've seen the reports of uh, uh, of Corey Feldman coming out and talking about how there was all these pedophiles sure. around him when he was younger and all that. And I actually, I 100% believe him. I, I believe Hollywood is infested yeah. with these pedophiles. You take a look at somebody like Lou Pearlman, 
who was hanging around O Town, the Backstreet Boys, who's involved with a lot of that stuff, and uh, they sent him away for all sorts of uh, of uh, criminal acts that he <laughs> conducted, and, and he was he was definitely involved in a a lot of that insane stuff. But you know, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot uh, that goes on behind the scenes with pedophilia, you know, with this type of disgusting behavior and uh, absolutely i mean we take a look at the cia and their mind control programs what's the best way to traumatize somebody well i mean if you're a young child if you have some disgusting pedophile doing all this insane stuff to them they're going to be pretty well traumatized for the rest of their life so i can see from a from a really sadistic point of view if you want to engage in mind control research then you're going to bring in these pedophiles who enjoy doing this and you're going to use them as the means uh, to develop your mind control research. And I believe fully that's what happened with Michael Aquino and, the, and his Temple of Set and, and his links to the army and all that. It, I mean, it all appears well, so well connected and it makes a whole lot of sense if you, if you think how they think. Well, absolutely. And, and another interesting c connection with Michael Aquino and this whole thing to me has been uh, part of the mind war thing that he developed was... Uh, uh, also something called RMA, which was the Revolution in Military Affairs. And uh, uh, those, those, those of you who have ever seen the movie uh, The Men Who Stare at Goats, or you've read the book by <laughs> John Ronson, The Men Who Stare at Goats. Yeah. Um, and, it, well, what they, what they don't tell you is, is they, they, they have these people in the story and stuff that supposedly came up with this. But what they, what they don't tell you and what they never mention is Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino is absolu absolutely the guy uh, who invented RMA, uh, Revolution in Military Politics, the uh, in introduction of the most kooky third-wave New Age ideas into military long-range planning, which introduced such notions as information warfare and cyber warfare into the Pentagon's lexicon. Aquino coined the phrase and the idea of information warfare or info wars. And uh, this was uh, when he introduced these these tanks, you know, like you saw in the Ministerial Ghost, these, uh, you know, the Jedis and these, uh, these different techniques of fighting the enemy and stuff. Well, I just find it fascinating too, Lee, with all the connections we've already seen with Aquino and mind control and the info war things to Jones, and then to find out that the guy that wrote that book, the Minister of Ghosts, John Ronson, uh, wrote the book Them, that was uh, an account of all these different uh, encounters with him and various conspiracy theories, like him going to uh, the Bilderberg Group meeting with with Jim Tucker. And uh, he was also, John Ronson was also the guy who was a part of the TRIO uh, documentary special uh, where Alex Jones allegedly snuck into the Bohemian Grove. So what are the odds that John Ronson would be involved with writing both uh, The Men Who Stare at Goats, which uh, had to do with Aquino, and then also uh, is just, you know, single-handedly sneaking into the Bohemian Grove with Jones, which, by the way, if you believe that uh, he actually snuck into that place without any help, I got a bridge I want to sell you in Montana. It's real cheap. Um, there's right. just, there, the guy just wandered through the woods and wound up right in the parking lot. Come on. But, yeah. Um, but well, yeah, of that, course. That, I mean, that's also... Well, it, it's totally ridiculous because of the fact that all these important people go to the Grove. They're not going to allow somebody just to walk in like, like he was able to do. So Right. Right. And that's where they were. That's where they were doing all of these uh, these Aquino, uh, MK Ultra, uh, sex child sex slave stuff. At anyway, that's where uh, uh, Doctor Edward Teller was doing his stuff. I mean, uh, yeah, same area. Yeah, I mean, even Paul Bonacci, Paul Bonacci, who uh, won the one million dollar judgment against Michael Aquino in the civil in the civil case uh, under lie detector test, said that he uh, uh, that he was there when. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson was filming him having sex with this other boy, and then they took both the, all the guys that were there started taking turns on them after that. And then after they were done, uh, they shot this guy in the head and then dumped his body, this kid in the head, and then dumped his body on some back 40 of the, uh, of the Bohemian Grove. And supposedly, Hunter S. Thompson was getting ready to come out about that information. That, and uh, he also, just before his death, had started coming out and talking about 9 11. Very right after 9/11, saying that 9/11 didn't look like they were telling us the truth, and it's probably a pretext to go to uh, war in Iraq and all this stuff. And uh, then he dies by uh, uh, you know a suicide, and uh, with a lot of people speculating that you know it wasn't actually suicide, and he had you know he wanted to live and all this stuff. But um, it's it, it just I, again I fail to see it as a coincidence that we have Jones connected to John Ronson, who you know is. 
he's there working on the Grove thing with him, and then he's also working on Men Who Stare at Goats with Aquino. I mean, this is all just too tight a company to just be uh, randomly unrelated connections. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's all sorts of extremely bizarre connections when you dig into this. And, of course, um, General Albert Stubblebine, he, he's been, a, of course, a guest on the Jones Show frequently, and he's also come out talking about 9-11 truth and how uh, the planes don't fit and all this stuff. I think that was the same guy. Um, well, I mean, General Stubblebine, he's, of course, he was a major figure in that book, The Men Who Stare at Goats. And he was involved at high levels uh, within the intelligence community. So uh, there's an R link. And it just seems as if these links keep piling and piling on each other. And it, it becomes yeah, impossible. Yeah, I was aware of that. To, yeah, it, it's, it's insane. It, it just, it's impossible to ignore all these connections to think that th there isn't anything going on here. It, it just, it's way too coincidental. No, it absolutely is, and that's I, I I did not know about the Stubblebine connection, but I do remember him in the book and in the movie. Yeah, so wow, I didn't I didn't know Jones. I just don't pay attention to Jones enough anymore to to know that. But uh, wow, I mean that's crazy that he that he actually had him on a guest. That's that's yet another connection. Well, uh, yeah, I mean I, after making this film and after doing the research, and and I think after people watch it, um, and uh, and really see for themselves and do do the research for themselves from the information that's in the film, uh, and for me, I, I'm I'm absolutely one hundred percent convinced that uh, Alex Jones is a part of an ongoing psychological operation to uh, uh, militarize and radicalize uh, citizens of the United States into believing that they have to fight against this shadowy enemy who is a threat to Christianity and threat to, um, you know, good God-fearing Christians and, and all this stuff. And uh, I believe that that's what the martial law and the FEMA camps and, and uh, the pretext to take our guns is really for. And that's why he's getting up there acting like he's fighting that. But meanwhile, if you really do the research and really look into it, he's one of the biggest people that is trying to bring that about. And uh, you know, the connections fit the crime. And you can definitely see that this has been an ongoing, uh, an ongoing operation. And it just has different players at different stages of the game. But it does seem every day that we seem to be getting closer to uh, a lot of this stuff coming to a head and coming to fruition in, uh, in our time. Well, yeah, and what's really funny about this is, is the fact that uh, I know uh, you started talking about this uh, a while ago. I, I did as well. Uh, the fact that it seems as if they're trying to bring this country closer and closer into a situation where we're going to have massive civil strife or even a civil war. And what I find fascinating about Jones now is that he's actually starting to mention that. He's saying that all the establishment wants civil war, but he's playing a major role in trying to bring that about. <laughs> That's why I find so fascinating about this. And, uh, well, I mean, who's going to benefit if you have a civil war? It's going to be the establishment because you're going to have people on both ends of the spectrum that don't really have anything to do with the power elite, but are going to be told through all these mind control operations and all this media propaganda that they have to fight the enemy for X, Y, Z reason. And it seems like Jones and all these operatives that he surrounds himself with they're attempting to galvanize these Christian populations in America to take up arms, as you mentioned, against the government. And as much as I despise the government, as much as I hate uh, the entire world order system as it is, uh, that is not going to be the answer to the problems that we have here. No, and they, you see, they tried to achieve this in the 90s. And uh, they really, I agree. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Even then, you know, even then with uh, Oklahoma City and with... Uh, with Tim McVeigh and with uh, Ruby Ridge and all that stuff, and then of course, uh, even then with Jones being the uh, one of the main players in that during that time or during Y two K and uh, Operation Megiddo, Project Megiddo that they ran to try and uh, identify uh, Christian uh, gun owners who believe in a new world order conspiracy to set up a United Nations takeover on Y two K. And they actually had an operation going round these people up and uh, and put them on camps. And meanwhile. You know, Jonesy's up there yelling and screaming, telling people to lock and load, and you know it's time to it's go time and all the rest of this. So, um, I you know I, I I sort of think that they're they're trying to do that yet again, and I think that there there is going to be some sort of major psychological operation at some point surrounding uh, Ron Paul and surrounding the elections that I think could be the the catalyst that would uh, you know start the rallying cry of. Okay, you know the cartridge box is fa I mean the ballot box has failed us, and we got to go to the cartridge box. 
And, uh, you know, I can't implore to people enough to resist that, 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 that type of uh, uh, call and resist going to that when, when, when they hear it. Because, um, again, in order to be able to gain full control, they have to get us to go completely nuts and lose all our control to the point where people just believe that, that okay, well, it's time to, you know, it's time for violent action. But I don't think that people quite realize what sort of authority that situation gives these people now. It gives them the, the authority to do anything they want to stop it. If that means unleashing, uh, you know, all this technology that they've been using in Iraq on us, that they'll do it. They'll bring, you know, they'll, if that means bringing in foreign militaries, they'll do it. But um, ultimately, it's sick because ju it's just like every other black operation, every other thing they've ever pulled off, folks. That's why you know that this is coming from the highest echelons. In every operation, be it 9-11, JFK, or anything else, it's always plausible deniability. They always have the ability to assign blame to someone or some other thing other than them. And if, if this country or other parts of the world, the UK, the European Union, start to uh, dissolve into civil unrest and civil upheaval and civil war, to the point where they say, okay, you know, we're sitting in the military, we're, we're, we're unleashing the, the, the hounds of hell now. At that point, they can do anything they want. They can take guns, they can do any sort of, any, any, anything they want and gain total control. And uh, that's what this whole thing is about. And it's sick that just like the model they use to build up the Taliban and phony Al-Qaeda and all this stuff, you know, sending out these phony figureheads and these phony leaders, these actors. And literally, a lot of these guys are actors. A lot of times, I mean, there's you've read about this stuff, Lee, about them. I mean, they'll have they'll have Jewish guys dressed in freaking burkas and uh, and stuff that are supposedly these Al Qaeda figureheads, and they go out and you know <laughs> right. tell uh, these these young guys that they need to fight for Allah for the jihad and give them weapons, and then you know get them all ramped up. And they go out and blow something up, and then boom, Al Qaeda uh, blew up a military base today. And, uh, you know, the, the guy who radicalized that was no more of a, uh, of a figurehead or anything than anybody else. He was, he, you know, he was basically just an actor. Well, that same kind of model now is what they're using here in the United States where they have these actors and these people like Glenn Beck and Alex Jones who are uh, speaking to that populist anger and speaking to that lowest common denominator. And then that's reflected by what they're doing with these phony economic uh, situations and these collapse meltdowns and these reset buttons so they can continue their Ponzi scheme all over again. That's another reason why they run those at the same time. Because then again, plausible deniability. Well, you know, we had the recession. That wasn't our fault. You know, blah, blah, blah. That's just what happened as a result of the economic shift. That's everybody's fault. See, at every turn, no matter what ends up being the end game of all this, they are setting themselves up to be blame-free. That way they can control who the new power is that comes into place after the, all the uh, upheaval dissipates and things start to reset themselves. They create the chaos, they come into the ensuing chaos, and they set up a new order. That's their MO. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting you brought up Ron Paul because uh, I want to get your take on this since you brought it up. You take a look at this circus, this election cycle, and I gave up after 2008 thinking that we could actually make any sort of real change through the electoral system. Because first of all, you've got phony electronic voting machines. And a lot of these politicians, as you mentioned, uh, are, well, just like the media, uh, they're actors. They're just people they put up there in front of the camera, and they play a role. And uh, I, I think Ron Paul is pretty much uh, within that same realm and scope, even though he might talk about different things, and he might seem like he's different, he's still a politician. And I'm just wondering what your take is on this, because I've felt for the longest time, for the past year or so, that Ron Paul was going to play a major role in this uh, election cycle, and it looks like he is. Um, I mean, do you think he's going to run third party, and do you think there's going to be some sort of event that they're going to trigger involving him? Because it sounded like that, that's what you were alluding to, and uh, I'm wondering if that's the direction they're going to take this, or if they're just using his campaign to kind of keep people in our box. Uh, do you think this could be used to galvanize a, a certain event, or what's your take on this? Oh, I certainly think it's a possibility. I, I don't want to say 100%. I think that's that's absolutely going to happen, but I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, telling my audience and, and my listeners that, yes, I, I do see that type of situation 
uh, as a possibility. And I have seen that for quite some time. I've been saying that for a few years. And uh, uh, it just seems like the, sort of the perfect thing because in the first go around with Ron Paul uh, in the last elections was kind of, um, and I think one of the reasons why that campaign now, in hindsight, we can see why that campaign was run the way it was. Because at that time, it was really just building up, um, like building up the fan base, so to speak, building up uh, the support, not really trying to go and play in the big time and waiting for this go round. And now that they've gone this go round, um, the, the game has changed. And yes, I, I think there is a possibility there could be a third party run here. And uh, I think that that people undoubtedly the, the the climate has been created now where, uh, where where that's a lot more viable of an alternative for people. It very well could be that. Um, and again, this is these are all possibilities. I'm not saying these are absolutes, but it very well could be that that's really how they want to show people uh, the further decline of their belief in, uh, in in politics and in in government in general is by uh, you know having all this rigged election stuff happening or you know having chicanery where Ron Paul gets cheated and they you know it's obvious and they put that out there in the media and people get all angry about that or uh, that's one scenario or even possibly. Um, you know, having something where, uh, the third party starts be getting, uh, you know, more votes than the actual mainstream Republican party. That's another thing. And then, uh, cause there's already people that have over the past several years been writing articles and talking openly about the end of left, right politics, the end of two party politics. They want to go to a parliamentary form of government in this country, uh, just like they have in England. That's been the plan for the longest time. So that very, this very well could be how they're going to sell it to us. But I think that undoubtedly uh, there's going to be an operation c uh, concerning Ron Paul. Maybe they'll, um, you know, maybe some crazy left-wing uh, loner that happens to, you know, own a gun uh, shoots Ron Paul or something. They spark it off that way. I don't know. That's one possibility. Maybe uh, they do some vote rigging stuff and make it very obvious. And maybe that gets people up in arms. I, you know, I, it's all speculation, Lee. I, I really don't know. Um, I can't say exactly what I think is going to happen, but I, I do think that uh, a major operation surrounding Ron Paul, which will then be galvanized and uh, used as sort of a chicken little scenario for Alex Jones, will uh, will play out during this election cycle. And I think it's why it's going to be important. And I think it is important now more than ever for people to look into the information in, in, in my film and in your stuff and uh, the Secret right Volume 2 because... You know, the media is happy all day long to call Ron Paul, um, you know, a racist and a white supremacist and bring up these newsletters and all this stuff. But you don't see them. They won't touch Secret Right Volume 2. They won't touch the information. It's in there because if they touch that and they expose that, they find out that exposes them as well. And, uh, you know, they, they can call him a white supremacist all day long, but they don't tell you why that's relevant. They don't tell you that's why that's important. They don't show the whole connection to the John Birch Society and the right wing and how that connects to white supremacist movements through the John Birch Society, Revel of Oliver, the whole connections. And that's what I really tried to do with this film is to give people the opportunity to have a tool to say, look, you know, don't just um, dislike Ron Paul or think he's a racist because the media tells you that. Look in and see why that's relevant and look into this and understand that it's, it's much bigger than just him, his connections. Like you said, Lee, he's a politician, but the guy is willing to be whoever anybody wants him to be at any given moment, it seems. If he's going on the Alex Jones show, um, yo, yeah, I believe we need a new investigation into 9-11. Absolutely, blah, blah, blah. Boom, gets all the support and all the money from the Alex Jones listeners. Um, next thing you know, he's hanging out with the Stormfront crowd. Absolutely, I believe in Stormfront issues. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when he goes out in public and somebody says, hey, do you support Stormfront? Absolutely not. I don't support them. He hangs them out to dry. Hey, what about 9-11? Uh, are you going to renounce everybody in those 9-11 truthers? Well, I, if they uh, support me, they wouldn't uh, associate me with those beliefs. So the guy's just willing to be whoever anybody wants him to be at one time, which which is absolutely um, the number one reason why you can't trust him. But on top of that, his uh, connections to these big-time players in the right wing, the Heritage Foundation connections, the CMP connections, the connections to uh, Zionists like Lou Lehrman, he, he's totally establishment and uh, he's really just somebody who's, who they put another face on. But of course, the media is not going to get into those deeper connections that we get into in the Secret Right vol Volume 2. They're just going to tell you, okay, he's a racist and believe us because we told you that's true and here's our shoddy evidence and research. So 
that's one of the things that I think is important about the, the research into this topics that you and I are doing, Lee, is that, um, you know, people think we're just focusing on one end of it or just focusing on the right wing or something. But actually, that's not true, because when you expose this end of things, you don't just expose the right wing, you expose the entire operation. Yeah, definitely. And it really, I mean, what you're seeing with like the Tea Party and, and uh, the whole Ron Paul movement and all that stuff, you, know, you see the same type of thing happening on the other end of the political spectrum with the Occupy movements and, and all of those things that have kind of popped up over the past six or so months. So th what they're trying to do is they're trying to radicalize the two extremes, as the media calls it, and, and to try to get these people as angry as humanly possible. And it, it's very fascinating to see how this is taking place. But, man, I mean, Ron Paul is a very interesting figure, and uh, I think what you said about the media covering this garbage with the newsletters, you know, it, it's basically, it, this in of itself is a psychological operation on so many levels, because first of all, the newsletters themselves, okay, so there were stuff that was put in newsletters that was questionably racist or, or may have had some uh, racial overtones. And it's almost like it, they put this out there intentionally because, as you mentioned, it is shoddy. So then it indirectly, it's going to make the people who support Ron Paul angry that the media is presenting this evidence that is pretty flimsy and shoddy. But they never get into the real connections between the John Birch Society, Ron Paul, and, and these other people that are connected to him and, and why that's significant. You don't see the media actually delving into the Heritage Foundation and, and asking, okay, well, well, Dr. Paul, I mean, well, why are you connected to Bruce Fine, who is a, a member of the Heritage Foundation, and, and why do you support an organization like that in which they called for using food as a weapon back in the early 1980s? I mean, of course, that clip is in your first film, The Secret Right Volume 1, or the, the first Secret Right film, rather. Um, of course, you did mm -hmm. another film before that. So it's very interesting to see all these different psyops that are being played out and how it's presented. It's very carefully crafted and very carefully packaged. And, uh, of course, like we've said many times before, I mean, they do these operations for not just one purpose, but for multiple different purposes. And it seems like this is certainly one of those particular situations. I, I, I really think that the, uh, and I read the, the letter in uh, Secret Volume 2 with that, the... Uh a quote from uh, Bill White, the uh, the white supremacist who had uh, uh, the the he's the commander of the American National Socialist Workers Party, uh, and had many dinners with Ron Paul. There's a there's a quote from his uh, from this his statement, and I'd like to read this. And uh, it, it it's just amazing. He says, "I've kept quiet about the Ron Paul campaign for quite a while because I didn't see the need to say anything that would cause any trouble." However, reading his latest release from his campaign spokesman, I'm compelled to tell the truth about Ron Paul's extensive involvement in white nationalism. Both Congressman Paul and his aides regularly meet with members of the Stormfront set, American Renaissance, the Institute for Historic Review, and others at the Tara Thai restaurant in Arlington, Virginia, usually on Wednesdays. This is part of a dinner that was originally organized by Pat Buchanan, Sam Francis, and Joe Sobron, and has since been mostly taken over by the Council of Conservative Christians. I have, I have attended these dinners and seen Paul and his aides there, had been invited to his offices in Washington to discuss policy. Um, for his spokesman to call white racialism a small ideology and claim white activists are wasting their money trying to influence Paul is ridiculous. Paul is a white nationalist of the stormfront type who has always kept his racial views and his views about world Judaism quiet because of his political position. And um, that's, you know, th that's a powerful statement there because it, that... Uh, that statement by Bill White, also, as I was mentioning before, that's, that's exactly to a T, his views of 9-11. And, uh, you know, whether he knows it or not, he had a lot of people who got a lot of money from and support from people on the last campaign who believed that Ron Paul uh, was going to support, uh, you know, new 9-11 investigations because he said that on certain radio shows. And then, of course, when he was put into public forum, he hung all those people out to dry and... Uh, just like he does to Bill White or anybody else. I, I think it's just very telling that <coughs> somebody now people that he's even connected to have seen his behavior and seen him doing this and are calling that out. Um, so when people he's actually been involved with say that, and then you and I say it, uh, I mean, that's a pretty good case. That, that is what's going on. 
Well, I, I mean, yeah, the 9-11 issue, I think, is pretty cut and dry. I have to look more into the whole white supremacist angle, but uh, it, it's very interesting you know, to see the parallels that you illustrate in your film. And, I mean, certainly in the 9-11 issue, you take a look at how, depending upon his audience, like on the Jones show, he'll say those things that, oh, yeah, I, I have some questions about 9-11 and whatnot. And he even told me that. Now, of course, I conducted an interview with him back in, when was it, 2007, before I came across all this yeah. information. And um, Right before you started your show. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, that's when I first started doing this. And, you know, I was pretty much, I was fully on board his campaign because he was talking about issues that uh, I thought were interesting. Me too. And, yeah, and um, it, it was really fascinating because, uh, yeah, I mean, the issue of 9-11, for somebody as smart as, as Ron Paul is, I have no doubt that he's an intelligent man. For somebody to be this heavily involved with politics and to not recognize what 9-11 was is completely insane. Period. You know, you know I mean, it, it just, it's nuts. And to not call for a new investigation and, and all these things, it, it really shows you that this is an issue that has been off limits and will probably be off limits for I don't know. Maybe in our decade. Well, Who the hell you knows? have heard the you have heard the clips where he you have heard the clips where Ron Paul actually says he he wants a new investigation, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but then he'll yeah, say something different. It's actually audio, yeah. right? But that's the whole point. Is where I mean, we have. I mean, we actually have audio clips of him saying that. So it's not like somebody just made that up or assumed that. Oh well, maybe he supports 9-11 truth because he went on the Alex Jones show. No, no, no. He literally at one point did say on on tape on the record that he believed there should be a new investigation. But then, like you said, uh, as soon as he's put in, in a forum where, okay, well, let, let's say you got you know so many listeners on the Alex Jones show. Okay, this is a small, limited audience, so I'll say that here. But then you put me on television in, four, in front of 4 million people, and because I'm a politician, I'm going to backtrack. And I mean, look at Barack Obama. This guy changed... Uh, he, he, this guy backtracked on things he said he was going to do before he was even elected. I mean, he was making promises at the beginning of the campaign and then breaking those promises before the campaign was even over. Um, that's how these guys operate. They're there to tell you what you want to hear. And unfortunately, people who have paleo-conservative ideas and want to get back to limited government and uh, sound money and uh, the Constitution, I hate to have to tell those people they're being sold to and being told exactly what they want to hear by a slick salesman named Ron Paul, and that's really all there is to it. Well... Uh, unfortunately, I have to agree. Um, you, you know, it's uh, unfortunately it's really hard to even explain this to people who understand the basics of the world order structure. I mean, it, it's tough because I've had people come up to me and say, "Oh, you gonna support Ron Paul?" I mean, why aren't you supporting Ron Paul this time around? And I, I tried to tell them, "Look, I, I've given up with the electoral system. All, all these people—they're uh, just a bunch of actors. All, all they do is tell you what you want to hear." And it's a waste of my time. I mean, I didn't vote in the New Hampshire primary. You know, it, it, was, it was not worth my while. But I really see the electoral process at this point in time as like a, this disgusting form of social control because they give people these false choices. And based upon these false choices, people think that they actually have a choice as to who runs the country when they actually have no say whatsoever. So I don't know. What's your take on that? Do you agree that the electoral system is pretty much just a system of social control at this point? Uh, because of its total lack of of relevance that it really has. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it, obviously it's uh, it's the illusion of choice, the illusion of participation, the illusion of having a say in uh, in what goes on in the world. But that also is is what's giving these people a free license and an open license to do whatever the hell they want to do because um, because of this system being done under the guise of okay, well, you elected us, the people chose us, you're the one that wanted us here, right? Whether or not that's true or not, and uh, obviously, we know these candidates are pre-chosen, predestined for us ahead of time. We know that uh, uh, we're just allowed to choose from the choices that they allow us to have. But, um, you know, that's, uh, that's the whole thing about it is that people have now, um, in, in many ways, a lot of people have figured out that it, this is an illusion and that uh, non-participation in that system and not verifying that system as being legitimate and acceptable to you some people, a lot of people, start to figure out now that that's really one of the one of the best ways that we can take action against all this. I mean, people. Some people think that just going in and putting, you know, Donald Duck or uh, Mickey Mouse's name on the ballot or something is, you know, hey, well, I'm, you know, whatever. But that's just as bad as going and voting for any candidate because 
you're still saying, yes, this system that you're giving us and providing for us is acceptable to me. I just have issues and problems with uh, who exactly is running it. And then they make that the, the nonstop constant issue. And then what happens? It's just year after year after year after year, uh, on and on and on of us endly, endlessly doing the same thing over and over again, arguing over, um, you know, who's going to be the better person for the job. When in reality, it doesn't matter who gets elected. The program goes on, the operation goes on, and these figureheads are put there to assign blame and to be the scapegoats for these decisions that are made in, at the highest levels of, uh, of the control power of the, uh, of the entire world. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that any kind of participation in this system is, is verifying to them that, uh, that you're okay with that. And, of course, that's what Ron Paul and Alex Jones seem to do as well. Alex Jones uh, doesn't seem to have a problem with um, – the United States or anything else. He just wants a different type of people running it. When, unfortunately, with these Christian reconstructionists and uh, these people who want to take us back to an old, uh, you know, Ten Commandments, rule of law, an eye for an eye and all this stuff, and they want to take us back to this, uh, you know, this Christian reconstructionist uh, belief system where, you know, the, the people who have authority, the state has authority because they're, deemed you know from god or they're in touch with the i mean this that that's the same kind of um divine right to rule stuff that these bloodlines have been doing from time immemorial and that literally is the system of government that these secret right operators want to bring in the united states they want that kind of divine right to rule you have to do what we say we have the right to make the laws for the people because we are actually divine uh from the creator to do so and uh, these people are certainly um, divined by a creator of something, but I don't think it's a creator of anything good. It's definitely all things evil. Uh, there's no question about it. It's completely insane when you start digging into this. And uh, it seems as if some of these characters actually want to bring back uh, what I've heard to as being referred to as the Noahide laws. I think that's the same thing that you were talking about. We would bring back yeah. this uh, Old Testament rule of law, which is... I mean, look, I mean, the Old Testament, if you read what's in that, and you take a look at the God of the Old Testament, I, I don't think he's a very good person. I, I think he kind of sucks, to be quite honest with you. I mean, how many people did does Yahweh kill versus, uh, versus Satan or Lucifer or the devil? Um, <laughs> you'll see that Yahweh kills far many more people in the Old Testament. So um, I, I think it's very dangerous to go back to a, a, a theocratic system of law and and take a look at any country that's had a theocratic based system of law in which you have this official state religion or laws that are based off of an official religion it, usually what's happened is that the people are oppressed and you can take a look at Europe in the middle ages with the catholic church basically using these catholic nobles to oppress the populations uh, you know going after people that they deem to be heretics it, it's some scary stuff and and a lot of these people that are in the uh, are in your film and you discuss in the film, they're really tied into a lot of these same ideologies, and that to me is a very frightening thing. But uh, man, you know, when you see all these different people that have these belief systems, you have to ask the question: Okay, are these people running things actually going to improve the current situation that we have here? And I would say that's a definite no. Well, absolutely, and it, it doesn't matter what, what side of the aisle they're on. Uh, we, we can boil all these people down when you really do your research. Left, right, doesn't matter as all being pawns and a part of continuing the agenda in some way, shape, or form. They may put a new, uh, you know, they may do, put a new outfit on it. They put a, a different kind of perfume on the pig. They may make it look different and smell different and sound different. But, uh, uh, you know, again, it, they, they do that in every, every time there's a new president, they do that. They they seem to tend to put this mystique into people's minds that because it's a new president, somehow things have somehow shifted or changed in some way uh, when they haven't. They've just continued on business as usual. And, uh, I mean, I don't think that there's ever been a period in the United States where uh, we've seen and, and the, the, as many extremes as we see now where people on 
both sides of the phony political spectrum of the phony left-right paradigm are equally as brainwashed. And that's a part of the radicalization we were talking about earlier where they're trying to get people up in arms for armed conflict. I mean, they've got both sides now whipped up in such a frenzy about these beliefs that have been implanted into th these individuals. People think that these thoughts are their own. They have no idea that these political beliefs, left or right, are being planted there by the controllers just for that exact purpose, to divide the people. The only way they get total control, the only way they get what they want is to get us to destroy each other. That way they can come in in the ensuing chaos and clean up and, and set up the new, world or, or new order. That's what they need us to do. And, and the longer we resist that, the longer we stave this off. And that's why I think it's, it's going to be most important to uh, you know, when this stuff does start popping off, not jump and run and, and, and start getting involved with it immediately. You know, sit back, watch how it's playing out. Um, you know, it'll become apparent to you really quick whether or not it's something that is actually starting from the people or something that they provocateured into happening. And uh, just about every revolution and every um, spark of conflict um, that we've seen in our recent history has come as a result of these provocateur situations. And that's one of their favorite things to do. And uh, it, it's one of the, the best, most effective ways that they can get the desired results that they're looking for. Yep, there's no question about that. And uh, that's what really makes me really spe or, uh, skeptical uh, about everything that we're seeing now. Because you have these two sides are being built up, and neither side is correct. I don't want to support either side. <laughs> but you see how the people like Jones, they say, well, you got to choose a side. Or, or then you got our people like Stuart Rhodes. He comes on the air and he says, you know what, folks? It's 1775 and we're almost at 1776. I mean, this type of rhetoric, they're literally trying to get people into that mindset uh, of this situation where civil war or, or violent conflict is inevitable. And, and that's a scary thing. I, I mean, I don't know about you, Josh, but... um. I've actually been thinking about potentially leaving the country at some point because, man, I mean, first of all, we have so many zombies in this country that are just brainwashed by television, which I believe makes these people extremely dangerous. And I just don't see any improvement from either side of any political spectrum that you look at in terms of this country improving in the next several decades. Uh, I think we have some serious problems here. Yeah, it's it, there's there uh, it's it, there's no turning back on turning uh, the United States of America around. I mean, we are a full fledged arm of the global government structure now, and really all that's left is uh, for us to experience all the things that uh, a, a country of, of of our status being downgraded uh, turns into, and that's going to turn into uh, you know third, fourth world cesspool. cesspool. And that's exactly where we're heading. And uh, there's no intense or, I mean, they're gonna be, you can have a million Ron Pauls in there. It's still not going to change anything. That's what people don't understand is that all this stuff is designed to fail. It's designed for this to happen this way so that uh, an equilibrium occurs where the power shifts from individual countries to the global power structure itself that's based on the corporate system. And that's exactly the form of government they want. And in order for that to come about, the lives that people in this country, the United States of America, Americans have known, is, uh, is going to come to an end. And there are a lot of people who are not going to know how to deal and adjust in living in not only a, a, a new country, but a new world. And uh, that's when I think it's going to get real ugly. Yeah, well, especially when you have the amount of people on food stamps, and I know I've made that point so many times on this show, but uh, I mean, when the system can no longer support those people, what are they going to do? If you have hungry people in the streets, uh, they are just going to go absolutely crazy and nuts. And also, it's not just them, but if you also have these yuppies that have the expensive automobiles, expensive homes, um, I mean, you got so many people that are just living off of credit. And uh, when this whole system implodes, what are those people going to do? They're going to completely lose their minds. So, I mean, it, it, everything that I see happening is just pointing in the direction that at some point you're going to see some sort of engineered scenario where you have 
this mass civil uprising, and it's being encouraged by these operatives that we've been talking about pretty much this entire show. And, and you know, another thing that I find very interesting is that Ron Paul, it, it seems like the only show, with a few exceptions, of course, but it seems like the only show that he has ever interviewed within the so-called alternative media is Alex Jones' show. And uh, I can't help but think that's by design as well. I, I'm sure you agree, correct? Well, I mean, the, 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 there's a reason for that, I think. I, I think that if w w these politicians like to go in what they consider to be um, a somewhat controlled environment, they know that the person they trust, that the person who's interviewing him, them is going to uh, basically be partisan, is going to be on their side, is going to say the kind of things that are supportive of them, and uh, is going to be a benefit. They're not going to, Ron Paul is not going to go on a show where he's going to run the risk of a Josh Reeves calling in and asking about the CMP or something. It's just not going to happen, you know. So I think that's the reason why they do that is because they shield these people from, um, you know, people asking the tough questions. Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because after I finished the interview with Ron Paul that I did back in 2007, and again, this is before I knew any of this information, you know, after the interview was over, uh, he, he said that um, I was a tough interviewer. And I thought I was just, I, I was pretty much doing a very positive, wow. yeah, I, I, I was very surprised that he really? said that. Yeah. Really? He absolutely said that. He said that, oh yeah, wow. you're a pretty tough interviewer. So I, I Man, think what I, was happening. I, I watched that video several times of you interviewing him. I've watched that several times. I mean, no, you were completely respectful. You asked questions that were uh, along with his, his way of thinking. Um, man, that's, that's oddly. It, it was kind of strange, but I think it's because some of the questions I asked him were, were not typical questions that he usually got. Um, it, it just seemed, it was kind of weird, but, um, I, I think kind of the, the whole interview, me interviewing him kind of caught him and his whole campaign off guard because the way it was set up is that there was a local access TV host that did a political show. And this woman actually ran for governor of New Hampshire but I did the same local access TV show in the same studio that she did her show. So she asked me, oh, we got Ron Paul coming in the studio. Do you want to interview him after I'm done interviewing him? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'll do it. And that's how we got the interview. And uh, it, it, was just, it, <laughs> it was just really strange when he said that. But uh, in retrospect, I think it kind of makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, because again, they you know they they they, they want to go on these um, these programs that uh, you know I mean because like they try to make a, well they try to get everybody mad with that with that CNN thing oh Ron Paul storms off and they try to use it oh yeah the media asked him about these newsletters and oh the terrible media and he stormed off but then uh, they had to come out later and said that oh no actually he didn't actually storm off that the actually the interview was over but they there for a minute they you know they at least tried to get people riled up about that that to me was one of those moments where they kind of showed their cards, you know, where they kind of proved us right in th this fact that they're, you know, trying to use him to uh, to get the populist anger up. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it's just, I don't know, it's very interesting to see all the, the intricacies that are going on here. But, uh, yeah, I, I think if, if politicians are outside of an environment that they're comfortable with or they're being interviewed by somebody they're not really familiar with, uh, I think it kind of sets them outside their comfort zone a little bit. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's very intriguing. And, and I, that's probably why he's on the Jones show so much. And uh, because, like you said, it's a controlled environment and he knows what to expect every time he appears on that show. And he's been appearing on his show for I don't know how many years, like 10 something years. So, it, yeah. it's, but it's very interesting that it's just very interesting that it seems like Jones always seems to get him on like uh, 10 times a year. Whereas if anybody else tries to get, Ron Paul on for an interview. It's very, very difficult. The only reason why I got an interview with him was because I got lucky. And on top of that, it was before the mania started with his campaign. It, prior, yeah. to, prior to when I interviewed him, there, his campaign really wasn't well known. It didn't get the amount of media attention. It, it got a couple months after the fact. So um, it's all very interesting. But um, do you have any final thoughts on Ron Paul and, uh, and his whole connection with the establishment before we go to uh, our last break? Well, uh, no, no, just just one final thing. I, I think that uh, uh, the, the the things that 
make someone um, worth looking into in regards to their connections to the secret right in in all these groups is uh, is just you know when you look at what the other people have been involved in somebody like Grover Norquist. Um, who you and I have both talked about several times. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> he's a character. Um, anybody who takes a real deep look into into that guy um, should have a serious problem with Ron Paul associating with him or or Lou Larrivan or any of these other guys. So um, it, it's it, it just it, it's mind blowing how deep the psyops have gone, where they have convinced people that what is right in front of their face is not actually right in front of their face. And when you take a step back from it, you're not in that mindset. You can see it. You know, it was a lot harder for you and I to see it when we didn't have all the information yet. And we were, you know, supporting Ron Paul and, 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 and Alex Jones or any of this stuff. And, and, you know, we couldn't see it because we were involved in it. But once we were able to take a step back from it and research it, look into the information, then it becomes clear. But then you find out, wait a minute, it's been in front of you this whole time. But because you allow yourself to be enamored and to be... Um, you know, just kind of taken in and drawn in by these mesmerists and these cult of personality figureheads, you you get caught up until so you can't see the forest for the trees. And I think that, that um, that's something that everybody out there who may be skeptical about the information that you and I talk about, um, that's, what, that's what I think that they, I wish they would think about. And think about that idea that sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees and you can't see right what's right in front of your face because... Um, Things are so bad, and things um, do need to change so much, and we want those things to change so much that it's easy for, for it's easy for us to fall victim and fall prey to these, um, you know, these these phony figureheads and these people who claim to be representing populist beliefs, but uh, in reality they're, uh, they're 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 supporting the system that everybody seems to be against, and uh, real people who take action don't. Uh, you know, they don't live in uh, million-dollar homes and have uh, office buildings in the most expensive real estate in Austin, Texas, and, and all this stuff. Um, it just doesn't happen. Real people who take action and do this are, are doing it down at the ground level, and uh, I don't know, man. I just it, It's real hard for me to trust what anybody about the New World Order says when they're living in a you know, million-five mansion with a living nanny and all this other stuff. It's just it, it's out of control. Well, yeah, that, that's, uh, of course, that raises a number of questions. And he keeps talking about, I'm talking about Jones, of course. He, he talks about how he, he keeps bringing on new people to his operation. Where is all this money coming from? Uh, does he really get that many DVD sales and uh, and prison plant TV members? I mean, maybe so. Maybe he gets uh, enough members. But a lot of this is because you got Matt Drudge funneling traffic to him. you got the mainstream media that's actually promoting him. Okay. I mean, look, I mean, I guarantee you, if anybody else had mainstream media promoting them, Matt Drudge linking to their site on almost a daily basis, well, they'd probably be as big as Alex Jones as well. You know, I mean, it's because the mainstream media is supporting his operation, but they want you to think that it's an underground media operation when that thing is the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, especially when you consider all the well, could, it, it, uh, links there. Yeah, they're connect he's connected to the same the same money pipeline that the mainstream media is. When you really look into it, I mean, uh, everything from the Brompton Banking Empire and Carla Khan, which I mentioned earlier. I mean, he's connected to the same uh, money stream that any of them of of the uh, the mainstream people are, and that's why uh, I've had a problem with the people that for years have said, you know, oh, Jones is controlled by ABC. Because he's on the ABC Star Guide satellite, but people, well, yeah, yes, that's true, but that doesn't mean he's controlled by ABC. Anybody that has money can rent that that satellite time from them for a fee. But what they did, what they never pointed out, is that if you really do the digging, you can find that the revenue streams connect to the independent media, to have people like Alex Jones, the same way they connect to the mainstream media, etc. Uh, the Adnan Kashiogi connection is is proof positive to that as well as uh, all these other different connections. I mean, uh, you know, Thomas Keene and, and his connection to Adnan Kashiogi and uh, him being head of the 9-11 Commission. I don't know why Jones ever brought that up. But, uh, I mean, it's it, it, that, that's what you really find is that at the heart of it, these people are all getting funded from the same place. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, people like you and I who are... Uh, uh, really telling people the real reality and try to show people the real reality of this and get them to look in, into this stuff for themselves and see it for themselves, 
um, you know, we're, we're funding these movies out of our own pockets and we're doing stuff out of, uh, you know, our, our support of our listeners and things of that nature. It's just, it's unbelievable to me that uh, this is still going on, but it's also unbelievable to me that there's as many people aware of it now uh, than there were, you know, two or three, four years ago when you and I first started talking about it. I mean, real, people are really starting to see a lot of this, Lee, a lot more than they used to. Well, yeah, I, I think it's a very positive thing that there are a lot of our people that are talking about this and, and, and openly discussing some of the same issues that we've been bringing up because I think people have looked into what we're saying. And even if you don't believe all of what we're saying, I, I think uh, there's enough people that have researched this stuff for themselves and, and they understand that there is more to this than they've been told by the mainstream alternative media establishment, and they're looking deeper and deeper into it. Um, but hey, Josh, I was going to take a break, but we only have about 45 minutes left in the show, and we got a ton of listeners on the streams. So uh, I, I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to continue and just do the rest of the show without a break, or, or do you need a break? Uh, I'd like to get a breather real quick, but for like just a couple of minutes. But uh, I mean, if you want to, if you want to hang tight till I get back or whatever, we can do it that way. It doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's do that. I'm going to continue talking here, and uh, I'll let you take your break. And uh, uh, okay. when you come back, you know, just uh, shoot me a message, and we'll continue the conversation. There's some other stuff I want to talk to you about. I want to get your take on 2012, awesome. since we're in 2012 now, if you can believe it. And also, I want to get into some other stuff that we haven't touched that is also in the Secret Right Volume 2. So I'll let you take a breather, and I'll continue uh, talking. Just let me know when you're back, and we'll continue discussing all these topics. All right, excellent. All right, well, we'll bring Josh Reeves back on when he's uh, taking a little bit of a breather. I know we've been talking for a while. Again, we're doing a commercial-free show. My guest is Josh Reeves, and you can check out his website at theglobalreality.com. Again, that's theglobalreality.com, and you can purchase his new film, A Cigarette Volume 2, which gets into the John Birch Society, the Council for National Policy, the links of these groups to the establishment hierarchy, gets into controlled opposition, gets into, uh, of course, the Alex Jones Corporation and how he is linked directly to the establishment with all these minions that he brings on his broadcast with, uh, of course, his connections to Fox News. Uh, the list goes on and on. And, and I just got the chance to uh, watch a little bit from the Cigarette Volume 2, and there's definitely a lot of fascinating information in there. And we've covered a lot of it on the show tonight. And it's important. It's vitally important to understand what is going on with controlled opposition because this is a tool that has been used over and over again by the elite hierarchy to convince you that there's an opposition to all the tyranny and there's an opposition to all the bad things that government is doing. But when you have the amount of resources, and when you have the amount of control that the establishment does, they can fund as many groups and organizations as they want to achieve the desired result. And that desired result is either one of two things, generally. One, because they don't want the opposition to do anything substantive against their agenda, so it's used for neutralization purposes. Or, if they want to foment some radical change, they will agitate the people that prescribe to the controlled opposition, get them stirred up in a frenzy so they can bring about either civil war or civil unrest or any number of scenarios that they have in mind that will help them pursue their disgusting agenda. And I think a number of examples that we've seen, uh, of course, recently uh, in Northern Africa and the Middle East back in 2011, last year, We saw these protest movements that have been engineered largely by design and supported by design for the purpose of some sort of radical change. And uh, this is something that you see quite often. Uh, There's a number of different tools that these people use, but certainly that is absolutely one of them. Because uh, the elite power structure, they get more and more control and more and more power when and if they create situations that have uh, a great deal of chaos intertwined uh, amongst populations. Because if you have chaos, then you can bring about the changes that are desirable. 
and uh, well, not desirable for us, but desirable for them. And it, it's really unbelievable. So a lot of these subjects are covered in the movie, and uh, definitely be sure to check it out. So I'm gonna wait a few minutes before Josh gets back, but uh, you know, I just want to comment on a few other things as well. Um, I, I know everybody has been, uh, of course, obsessed over the political cycle with the Republican nomination and uh, everybody's glued to their TV sets trying to get the latest information about what's happening with the Republican primary. And again, you have to understand that all of this is stage theater. I can't stress that enough. And it's exactly why I did not participate in the New Hampshire primary yesterday. I, I live up here in New Hampshire. And you have all these people running around with signs telling people to vote for so-and-so. And in the end, it just does not matter. Okay, because what you're really doing by voting is you're supporting a corrupt system. You're supporting a system in which you have countless cases of fraud. You have countless cases of suspicious behavior occurring uh, amongst people who count the votes. The whole thing is just a damn sideshow. And it's clear that the media is trying to prop up Mitt Romney to be the number one guy, to be the Republican nominee. And it looks like they're positioning Ron Paul to come in uh, with uh, second place in terms of the amount of delegates that it gets. And, and that could potentially be used to fuel a third-party run for president, which it's possible that uh, that may be set up. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't tell you exactly, but that seems to be the direction that they're steering this in because they keep saying, well, Ron Paul's got... Uh, enough votes uh, to come in second. And they keep emphasizing how he's going to play a, a major role in, in this whole process, like I've, uh, of course, been mentioning over the past several months. And now it's coming into fruition. So it, it's definitely very fascinating to see all this. But, um, you know, again, I encourage you, research the Council for Financial Policy. Look at the different players that are involved with that group or have been involved with that group. And, and you'll see that there's a combination of people who have been members of the Knights of Malta, have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations. In the case of some people like J. Peter Grace, well, he was Knights of Malta and a Council on Foreign Relations member, as well as a Council for National Policy member. Uh, a very dangerous individual uh, tied in with Project Paperclip and a whole number of uh, different things. Uh, look into him. And it, But there's, I mean, that's just one person. There are many different people who have had connections to the Council for National Policy as well as the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the group that, of course, is heavily involved in producing white papers and things of that sort that are oftentimes used as blueprints for policy that actually gets implemented or enacted. So it's very, very intriguing, to say the least, when you see how they put out this propaganda talking about how the Council for National Policy is somehow this junior CFR group. And we've heard Alex Jones say that a few times on his show. Uh, just a, a total lie, a total smokescreen. And uh, come to find out, you see all these people that not only are Council for National Policy members, but have also been connected to the Council on Foreign Relations. Even Phyllis Schlafly wrote a book with an Admiral Chester Ward I think uh, she wrote several books with him, actually. I think a couple, at least. And you take a look at that, and Chester Ward was involved in the Council on Foreign Relations. So it just shows you that all these people are connected, that it's the establishment as a whole, and you have different groups that represent slightly different ideologies. But that's all for the purpose of getting people ensnared into the system or believing in a certain aspect of the system because one group puts out an ideology that they might tend to agree with or or they might have some sort of sympathy towards. But it, it's just it's such a, a sick situation. It, it really is. Um, I can't stress that enough. And uh, the film I'm working on, False Patriots Volume 1, which gets into a lot of the stuff that's in Josh's film, um, it's going to dive very deeply into the John Birch Society, the CNP, um, particularly Jones. We're covering a lot of material on him. We're going to get into Ron Paul and Glenn Beck. And another thing we haven't talked about yet, it's interesting how you see how 
Glenn Beck has moved down to Texas. You got Ron Paul, of course, down there in Texas. Jones is down there in Texas. And um, it, it really seems as if the entire universe of these people is being centered down there with what could be a potential push for secession. Even Rick Perry, who, of course, is as establishment as you can possibly imagine, he's talked about a potential legitimacy of secession. And, uh, of course, any sort of secession could potentially lead to a, a more serious situation down the road. I mean, these are all very fascinating things to to discuss and to talk about. But um, we'll discuss these more when... Uh, when Josh gets back, we're still waiting for him to come back from his breather. I, I just wanted to keep talking to the audience oh, because... Did you oh. not get my, my message there, Lee? I, I sent you a message about five minutes ago saying I was back. Oh, really? No, I didn't. I was just yeah. rambling on and on. I, was <laughs> I didn't see your message. No, I, I, yeah, I sent you a message about five minutes ago and said, hey, okay, I'm back, and, uh, and you never, you didn't respond. But uh, Oh, damn. Well, I'm glad uh, you interrupted. Otherwise, I've been talking for the next half an hour. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I apologize. Sorry about that, but I... Uh, I want to add to no, it's okay. I want to add to what you were saying. Yeah, you were talking about uh, uh, the the scenarios with Ron Paul and, and the possible third party run and all that stuff, and Glenn Beck as well. I uh, I I'll throw one at you. I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, and this is just uh, wild speculation. But I was just thinking about this scenario, looking at different angles. I mean, yeah, it's possible they could do a third party run, but when you really look at the at Ron Paul's role in this election so far, it seems that Ron Paul has been. Uh, put in there to take away votes from all the other candidates to ensure that Romney uh, gets the nomination. Well, that would put him in a position where uh, Romney could possibly choose him as his running mate, which, uh, if you think about it, I mean, my goodness, wouldn't that be something? What if, what, what if there's some kind of, you know, they rig, yeah. they rig the elections, they rig the elections. You see where I'm going with this? They rig the Absolutely. elections. They get uh, they get Romney and Ron Paul in there, and then some right wing nutter, uh, mind control MK Ultra guy goes and takes out Romney, and we got ourselves a Ron Paul presidency. I mean, it's just a theory, but uh, my goodness, man, it's it's it, this stuff's too crazy to not at least think about. <laughs> oh my god! I, well, the thing is, is that um, uh, the, I mean, there's no question after this whole thing is said and done, Ron Paul is going to have a, a pretty strong constituency and a pretty strong support base within the Republican Party. That seems to be where this is going. So that would be extremely bizarre if uh, if Ron Paul actually accepted uh, <laughs> being Mitt Romney's running mate. Th that would throw a lot of people for a loop. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but um, man, there'd be some really no. pissed off uh, patriots and truthers out there if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that that might set Absolutely. up you know what, right there. <laughs> that's that's what I you know exactly. That's why I was. That's the only reason I even entertained that idea, Lee, because you know I mean, so you know I was doing the research and working on this film, and I'm just you know that's what you do when you're looking at this. You're trying to look at every possible angle because um, you know they had us all during the last elections. I think before uh, it was established that Obama was in there, uh, everybody was pretty sure it was going to be Hillary Clinton, and uh, boom, out of nowhere, here they come with. Uh, with with Barack Obama and change the whole game. The, the, you got to be uh, constantly looking at every angle from these from these people, and uh, just with the crazy stuff we've seen out of them already, something like that wouldn't surprise me. But uh, yeah, you were talking about Glenn Beck. Actually, it, uh, I haven't told you this yet, Lee, but actually, uh, Glenn Beck Studio, where that's at in Las Colinas, that's about I don't know about ten minutes from where I live. Oh, geez, have you seen him? Have you, have you seen uh, Have you seen Mr. No. Beck? I hadn't gone over there. I hadn't gone over there yet because I figured they probably got my picture like up on, on some plaque or something in some security desk. But uh, they won't let you within uh, a you mile. This joker place, coming probably. Like, <laughs> oh, oh no, probably not. They, they got they, they got pictures of me hanging up in there. I'm sure if you see him with a camera. <laughs> you know, definitely don't let him in. But yeah, I mean, it's not far. It, it's not far from uh, from where I live at all. And uh, that area over there is uh, they have a lot of. Uh, well, they had originally back in the 80s they had planned for it to be a. Uh, Kind of like an LA version, a version of LA inside of Dallas. They have movie studios and stuff over there, and recording. I've been in recording studios over there uh, in that same area before. But uh, yeah, it's it, it just, it, it just, it's just so it's just funny as you were mentioning uh, the different factions, and that's one of the I think one of the key elements to understand about the Council for National Policy. And I know you've discovered this in your research as well. 
is that the, that's really what the group represents. It represents, uh, and you mentioned this earlier, all of the different factions that make up the right wing and uh, that appear to the public to be, you know, libertarians are over here and paleo conservatives are over here and uh, militia types are over here. That's what the, that, 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 that's the public view that they try to, uh, to get people to believe. But the Council for National Policy, what that represents is all of these people from all of these different subsets and groups behind closed doors together formulating the overall plan that they individually will execute in their various and sundry operations. So uh, the fact that they, they, you know, they do it with so much secrecy, they don't make their membership list secret, they don't make current mem membership list secret, they don't allow press inside their meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the fact that we've seen almost a complete alternative media blackout on people trying to go out and figure out where these meetings are taking place and, and try to t <coughs> turn people and insiders to get inside information <laughs> the fact that people have just flat refused to even do that is, uh, is, you know, kind of disheartening in a way. Well, it is because you got Jim Tucker, who's, uh, of course, he, he's all over the Bilderberg group. He, he runs around the world and is given all his top secret Bilderberg information, probably because that's being fed to him intentionally. Um, so you got him doing that. Um, but you don't have somebody who is tracking the Council for National Policy and is able to get all this insider dirt on where they're meeting and and, and what's the next thing that they're going to do. And, and that, I think, it really it warrants a lot of questions. Because, again, what is so different between the Bilderberg Group and the Council for National Policy? Both these groups mean secret. They both try to keep their membership as secret as possible. But I would argue that the Bilderberg Group, when you take a look at the fact that they actually released their membership list, or the people who are attending their meeting, I believe it was back in um, 2008. I can't remember exactly. It was the one in Chantilly, Virginia. But they actually released yeah. the, uh, the people who were attending. Now, to my knowledge, they haven't done that with any of the Council for National Policy meetings. Yet you have some very powerful people that clearly, and they might not be as powerful as Bilderberg, I'm not saying that, but it, this is a very important group with some influential people, yet they insist on keeping everything uh, a virtual secret. So uh, there's a lot of questions there. Would you agree, Josh? <laughs> or did we lose uh, you? I, you know what? I, did, I didn't. No, no, no. Uh, your, your audio on my end has been cutting out the whole show. So I've only been getting like half parts of, of some of the stuff that you said. And all, all the questions up to this point have been good. But the last one, I just didn't get the last end of what you were saying. Just cut out real bad. So if you could repeat it for me, maybe I can hear it. Oh, sure. Yeah, I guess we're struggling with some audio issues. But, uh, but yeah, basically what I was saying is that it's ridiculous that you have the Bilderberg Group, which consists of secret meetings. They largely keep their membership list a secret. And you have the Council for National Policy that operates the same way but you don't see a whole lot of coverage on the CMP versus Bilderberg. And granted, the CMP might not be nearly as powerful as the Bilderberg group, but it's still a very important group within the hierarchy. So I just wanted to see if you agreed on that, and I think I know the answer, but just for the benefit of the audience. Well, absolutely. I think, I, yeah, I think, I think the big, the, the most important thing about it is, is that, um, you know, as you said, what, what, why, why can't we know who it, who is in these meetings? Um, why is it that what they're discussing is so secretive that you know it's got to be uh, it's got to be done behind closed doors? Of course, uh, the Bilderberg Group. I think that uh, th with with the amount of emphasis that's been put on them as being you know my, my big red flag for me is Alex Jones and you know and I just keep going back to that graphic from his movie Endgame where you know where you have the pyramid and the Bilderberg Group is on top. I mean. Um, all the best researchers that, that I've ever talked to uh, all have a general idea of, of what's on top, but I don't think anybody, one person claims the absolute no, because it's almost like you get up to a certain level and there's a block there. It's like you can see there's much more control going on, but it's either in another realm or in something that's not you know materially tangible. So, I, I mean, I, I just am always skeptical of the identification as the Bilderberg Group. Yes, those. Yes, they're powerful. Yes, they're the top heads of uh, the multinational corporations, and yes, they're going to be uh, doing their part. But the CMP is, in a way, um, 
almost exactly the same way, except they're not executing the operations on behalf of, you know, the Pepsi Corporation or the Nokia Corporation or Coca-Cola or whoever has representatives at Bilderberg this year. They're going to be executing their plans regarding uh, political issues that have to do with right wing. And, and so, you know, again, uh, I think that that if people really had an idea of what was going on inside of these Bilder of these uh, CMP meetings, it would give away too much information as far as where the, the talking points and the ideologies and the issues that our elected officials have in uh, the Republican Party are really coming from. And also uh, the ideologies that people on uh, in the CFR left wing end of it have as well. It's almost as if it serves as a conduit directly from the priest class and directly from those uh, associated with Rome. And, uh, you know, it, its formation was really something that ensured that no matter who you voted for in, in left or right and in the phony political spectrum we discussed earlier, you're going to be getting socialism. And uh, that's evident in the formation of all of these big think tanks, Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, the CMP, the Bilderberg Group, the CFR, any of them, and they all have uh, ties that go up back to the uh, to the different various roundtable groups out of the London School of Economics and uh, the entire foundation of the Fabian Society, who uh, has tentacles in every political party and in every uh, uh, belief system, left, right, even into uh, some of the more esoteric realms of theosophy and things of that nature. They have their... Uh, there are tentacles everywhere, and that's why the CMP is important, because it established really the, uh, the, the foundation of total control of the American political system. Yeah, I, I think uh, you brought up a lot of very good points there, and it, the, the thing is, it, it's one additional group that deserves scrutiny, and it, the thing that always raised uh, red flags for me was the fact that you didn't see people covering it with any sort of seriousness. And uh, that's that to me is a real problem, especially when you consider all the different connections that we've been mentioning on this broadcast. Uh, it's it just so incredibly extensive. I mean, you got all these people that have high level connections to the world order hierarchy, if you will, that have been members of this group. So it deserves a lot of question and um, or a lot of questioning rather. And, you know, and that's uh, really what it's all about. It just constantly questioning what these groups are doing and, and what their role is, especially groups that meet in secret. And, and you have all these powerful people that are, are meeting as part of these groups. And so the CMP is just one of those additional groups that deserves scrutiny. But um, Josh, I want to shift gears in the final half hour of the show. And uh, uh, I wanted to touch upon a few things. Um, the first thing I wanted to touch upon, uh, of course, we're in the year 2012. And it's amazing that we're actually here. I remember... Uh, of course, over the past <laughs> four or five years, everybody's saying that all of these things are going to happen in 2012 and, and whatnot. And well, here we are. And uh, we're literally just, what is it, 11 months away from the uh, December 21st, 2012 date. Uh, what's your thoughts on 2012? Uh, what do you think I is going to happen? I mean, what's your take? Well, I think that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I you know I first of all I gotta say flat just flat out I don't know uh, I I really don't I don't have any idea and I don't think anybody else does either uh, except the people at the highest levels I think that you have to certainly look at uh, at the things that are quantifiable and go with those first and then move from the quantifiable things into uh, the realm of uh, of the things that you could you should consider whether or not they're quantifiable or not and uh, the one thing that is quantifiable is is that we are. Uh, Heading into something that the the elders of the uh, the ancient societies and uh, have known for years and years and years, and that is galactic alignment um, and the procession of the equinoxes. That is that is something that is verifiable. And uh, in the in the past, when it's happened, we we have seen massive consciousness shifts and uh, possibly even dimensional shifts on the planet Earth. Now, whether or not that's going to happen or not, I, you know, I'm not going to say. I don't know. I, I can't say. But um, I think looking at some of these more quantifiable things like the, the fact that there seems to be a high, uh, a high energy level, a very energetic high energy level that uh, coincides with this um, 
galactic alignment and with this precession of the equinoxes and, and total photon belt immersion, it seems that uh, there, there's a high amount of energy coming to this in that whatever energies are manifested during that time are going to be amplified by this alignment. And so that's why I've been off put by the Nibiru stuff and the, and, and the doom and gloom uh, 2012 stuff book in the end of the mind calendar stuff is because um, the power of manifestation is very real. The power of uh, creating into our material reality things that are started out by the power of our own mind and our thoughts it is absolutely real. And it's one of the key tenets of Freemasonry and the whole entire secret society structure in general. Um, and this is one of the things that they know but they give us little hints of. They give us things like the secret, you know, uh, these phony things where you know that Oprah promotes and stuff like that. They give us that, and don't give us the context and really tell us the whole picture. But I think with uh, galactic alignment, with the raising of these energies, you have a perfect time to manipulate the populace of the of the world into manifesting doom and gloom and all this other stuff because of the access to um, higher energies and frequencies that we're going to be emanating in here in uh, towards the, uh, the end of this year. So um, as far as all the rest of the scenarios and all the rest of the stuff, you know, um, I think whatever happens is going to be a direct result of our manifestation. You know, um, the classic analogy, it just, it, it's funny and it's from a comedy, but you know, it really does fit from, uh, and there's a lot of truth in it from Ghostbusters. You know, uh, where they're up on top of the building and you know, marshmallow ch chills, chills. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, and, and all of a sudden he just, you know, it pops in his head, and that's what it is, and and that's you know, the, oh my god, the most ridiculous thing you can imagine. Well, I think there's a lot of truth in that. It almost seems that that's that's exactly what they're trying to get us to do. They're trying to get us to, uh, you know, manifest the state post marshmallow man. They're trying to get us to uh, manifest negativity and energy in the end of the world again. Uh, probably for some of the reasons we talked about earlier, by uh, that plausible deniability, that uh, alleviating themselves of blame and any connection to it, because again, it's something that we brought about ourselves. So, I think the best thing we can do in 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 2012 is is the same. The best thing we could do in in 1912 or 2032 is always be prepared for sh. You know what to happen because it's always going to happen, and especially when you start getting into times, the the alignments of the planets. And where Earth is in relation to other planets and other solar systems and its location around the sun, all these things are what the ancient societies knew. These are what the, uh, the ancient uh, secret societies knew and know to this day. And that's how you're able to gauge when big shifts and big things in the planet and consciousness and uh, reality itself are going to happen. So we just want to make sure that during this time that we're not um, allowing ourselves to manifest the negative and manifest what these people want because they want to they want to access everyone's mental powers and everyone's energy of their soul all over the planet simultaneously. And what a better way to do that than through media and mass culture and programming and movies, getting people to believe that you know the end of the world is right around the corner. And if enough people believe that, well, you well again you might just get to say pu pu marshmallow man, but. Um, I really do believe that this is the most important thing we can do right now is to continue to look at um, these alignments, look at these uh, things that the ancient news continue to dig and try to find out how we can uh, ride the wave of these things and actually benefit from them instead of being, uh, you know, drowned asunder under the wave of it. And I think that's what, from my research, what all of the, the esoteric philosophies and the hermetic philosophies uh, that's what they all knew throughout history was this uh, ability with, to be able to bring your mind and your, 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 your thought process and your thinking to, to a level where, you know, um, if the cataclysm does happen, you're going to be all right because you've trained yourself not to freak out and you've, you've accepted this and, and all this other stuff. But again, I, um, I, 2012 is going to be a banner year for the operations of, global government because well again they want to play in on that on people's belief system so um it's kind of like they build you know what a better way to execute your plan though build up 2012 in the minds of everybody and then when you really start hammering down on stuff and really uh bring in a lot of this neural order type uh power structure 
your people are going to be a lot more accepting of it on a global scale because people are going to believe that this is a result of, you know, 2012 and the end times they've been told. If you just spring this on people out of nowhere, people are going to freak out. And you're going to have revolts on your hands. And uh, the truth is going to get out there a lot faster than it would if you build something up in people's minds. So then when you start executing on those plans and going full tilt boogie and just, you know, like they basically like they're doing right now, going uh, just all out with this stuff. People just seem to accept it a lot more because they believe it's part of this 2012 thing that they've been uh, programmed to believe in. Well, sure, and those are some very good points. I mean, I, I've basically talked about 2012 in my show uh, for a while now, and uh, my personal belief is is that we're not going to see anything significant happen. But yeah, I think what you brought out, I, I think, is very intriguing because it, there has been all sorts of propaganda that has been pushed onto people about 2012. You have, of course, that 2012 movie that came out three years ago. Um, you have, of course, all the Doomsday specials on the History Channel. And it, even on CNN or CNBC, you see people creating these specials on 2012 Doomsday preparation. There are actually these people that have uh, converted these, these, these uh, former nuclear missile silos and are turning them into these bunkers. And they're getting ready for 2012. It, it just, it's amazing to see all the fear that's been perpetuated about 2012. So uh, I think what you said about the fact that they have built this date up or this year up uh, with all these doomsday implications, it, it allows them to more easily push ahead their agenda because it's what people are expecting. They're expecting all these bad things to happen. So <laughs> in some ways, right. it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy when you do that. And and I think that that's that's very indicative. That that's a that, that's a very uh, appropriate term you use right there, Lee. The the self fulfilling prophecy because uh, it seems to me that that's what these CMP guys and a lot of these people we've talked about, like LaHaye and others. That seems like that's their plan. I mean, um, I was talking about this on my radio show last night, Lee. On uh, and I and I know you've uh, discussed this with me before, but I'd like to bring it up here again. In uh, Tim LaHaye, the founder of the Council for National Policy, and his. Uh, Left behind series of books. He actually, when the uh, when the Antichrist appears, there's a conspiracy theorist character in the uh, in the book, and he's kind of a you know pastiche of Alex Jones and 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 Bill Cooper and all this stuff. Well, this conspiracy theorist is getting on his show, uh, telling everybody that the Antichrist is actually holograms from this government program where the government is trying to trick people into believing that. It's, uh, you know, it, it's the Antichrist so they can bring in a one world religion, new world order and all this stuff. And then the conspiracy theorist ends up getting killed by the Antichrist himself. I guess the, 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 the conspiracy <laughs> theorist was wrong. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, my point is, is that the way that Tim LaHaye describes this technology in there, um, it, you know, it really does sound like somebody who's intimate with it. So the idea of these guys on the right wing being the proponents and uh, when you look at their connections to the highest levels, it does make sense that these guys would be the proponents of this, you know, staged uh, messianic conflagration across the world where, you know, uh, messianic deities are depicted in holographic form and people are told that the uh, all world's religions have been interpreted wrong. I mean, it really does seem that that these people are trying to execute this plan so that they can make people believe that this is the fulfillment of their prophecy, but all the meanwhile, they've ran the entire world structure all of these years just so these things will play out in this way. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny, you mentioned Tim LaHaye's book. Um, of course, you've seen the movie 2012 where Woody Harrelson, of all people, <laughs> plays the, the role of the conspiracy radio host. And uh, doesn't he die at Yellowstone covering the big event? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. There you go. And, and and you know what's funny about that is what's funny about that is that is that when I was doing my show before that movie was out, when I was doing my show on Oracle. Uh, there was one show where uh, I was going off yelling and screaming. I was talking about I was actually talking about 2012, and I said that uh, you know when the, if the stuff does go down on 2012, I'm not going to go hide in the bunker like these people are doing or going uh, you know bunker down. I'm going to go. I'm going to. I'm just going to be broadcasting all the way to the end. I'm going to be going up on a mountain and yelling, screaming, bring it on, and, and broadcasting on the mountain. And I said this a full year and a half on the on, on the air before that movie was out. 
And sure enough, that's what Woody Harrelson's character does in the movie, exactly to a T, as I had said in there. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, I, I exposed Woody Harrelson a bit in the movie because his father was supposedly one of the uh, uh, one of the shooters of the Kennedy assassination, and uh, him and Harry Connick Jr. have both been big actors, and his dad was the guy who replaced Jim Garrison as DA in New Orleans, and both of them appeared on NBC's uh, Cheers together. I mean, it's just unbelievable, man, how far, how multi-generational this is and how it connects, and it's just everywhere. And, of course, uh, you know, you, you, you had uh, Oliver Stone later used, who made the JFK film, actually later used Woody Harrelson in his Natural Born Killers film, which was a, uh, uh, if you've ever seen that film, massive, massive psychological operation, trauma, tra traumatizing trauma-based mind control film there. Great film, but you got to call it for what it is. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting film. I remember, oh, yeah, there's a lot of disturbing scenes in there. I mean, you have that, of course, that really bizarre scene with Rodney Dangerfield and uh, Juliet Lewis, and uh, then, of course, Woody Harrelson comes in, and, oh, man. Well, you got to see the film, but, but you're right. There's a lot of very... Uh, uh, bizarre scenes in the movie. I mean, well done. I agree. It was it was definitely one of the uh, uh, better done films. I think Oliver Stone has put together. But but certainly a lot of trauma uh, was included in that picture. Um, you know what, Josh? We have about ten minutes left, and uh, in the last ten minutes, I just wanted to uh, get your take on uh, any of our information that you think is valuable that we haven't covered that is in uh, the movie that you just created, The Secret Right Volume 2. Is there anything that we haven't hit on throughout the past two hours and 50 minutes that you think uh, the audience should know and uh, look into? Well, absolutely. And uh, at, the, at the very end of the film, um, I bring up uh, a CMP member and a congressman from Texas by the name of Ralph Hall. And uh, Ralph Hall is a, a Freemason, and uh, he's a part of the... Uh, East Fork Lodge in Rockwall, Texas, and he actually has his uh, offices on uh, part of one of the uh, structures of this underground ancient rock wall in Rockwall, Texas. And uh, so I have some information on him and uh, some of the stuff that uh, his connections to this ancient rock wall and this ancient civilization that could be the oldest ever civilization on Earth and uh, some of his connections to that and the fact that's where uh, Alex Jones is originally from get into that a little bit of the film, but my next documentary film is going to be on, uh, uh, on the subject of, uh, ancient hidden, um, civilizations in the United States. And we're going to, uh, get into the, uh, to the rock wall stuff a bit. So it's going to continue from there. Uh, but what's, what's amazing to me is that in, in my research, it's just amazing to find these, no matter what it is I'm researching, here's these connections yet again to these same players. They appear there, and uh, boy, it makes it hard to deny the claims that people like myself and people like you have made about these guys being controlled by these, you know, priest class, ancient secret society types. When you see this, uh, the evidence for the massive cover up that's been going on in the United States on a lot of these uh, ancient sites and things that have been found. So uh, I'm really excited about getting into into that film next. I, I really haven't told people. Uh, much tonight about how they can get the films and stuff. I wanted to tell people that a little bit if I could, Lee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at go my website, right at vegoreality.com. Uh, go to com is our website. And up there under the, under the tab, it says SR2. You can go there. We actually have it on DVD and we have it on... Uh, uh, it's the first film I've made that's actually on Blu-ray as well. So you can get uh, in full high definition. It looks amazing in Blu-ray. And there's also some different packages there where you can get uh, a research pack and it comes with the, like this, the DVD and... Uh, an extra DVD that's for your it's for your computer. It's not one to put in a DVD player, but uh, it's 4.2 gig. It's a 4.2 gig data disc, and it has my entire picture archive from the film. It has uh, a lot of the clips that are in the film uncut. It has the complete 48 minute uh, Pedro Rupe Georgetown Jesuit film uh, clip in there. It's got the full uh, Geraldo, Michael Aquino, Ted Gunderson clip we were talking about earlier in there. Several things, but 4.2 gigs worth of data. So. Um, and people are just now starting to get some of their orders this week. And I know you said you got your DVDs too as well, Lee, but, uh, I think that's one of the things that, uh, people have really enjoyed about, uh, the way I've packaged this film this time is that, you know, they they get the film, they watch it. And like I said before, you know, you can go through and take notes. I, I really suggest everybody go through and write down these names that I name in the film, write them down and then go on your own time and go do Google searches and research each one of these individual names of these players and these characters 
that I mentioned in the film because I, I promise you, I'm not kidding you. I saw it for myself. There is there like like Lee said earlier. There's just there's you know spider webs and rabbit trails and things that just connect every which way. And I I just I, I want to implore each and every one of you out there if you end up watching my film or, or getting one of my uh, copies of the documentary that uh, please 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 write these names down. Please go research them on your own, and uh, you're going to find so much more. And you're going to end up in the end convincing yourself of these things that I've talked about, Lee has talked about, and I think that's the most important thing. I want you to convince yourself of it. I don't want you to be convinced of it because I said it or Lee said it. I want you to be convinced of it yourself, and I think that uh, between my, you know, I've made two films on the subject now, and I could make a third, and I might even, I might end up making a third. My next film's not going to be that. It's going to be something totally different, but uh, I think with my two films on the subject now, I mean, it, it, this movie's two hours and 48 minutes. The last one was uh, around two hours or so. So I've made about, you know, a little over four hours, almost five hours of film on the CMP. Lee's got five hours coming out. So between us, you know, we're, we're putting, we basically uh, will have put out 10 hours of information on these, uh, these connections and, and still not scratch the surface. And I think that's why it's just important for people to do their own research and why I wanted to provide, um, you know, these, these research pack discs that people wanted them, uh, uh, you know, buy them extra and stuff like that so that uh, that can help facilitate that research project for people, you know, because I think that's the most important thing is to, you know, I told you about this stuff for, you know, uh, over and over again, Lee, when I first started finding out about it, but it didn't hit you and it didn't become important to you until you researched it for yourself. Well, absolutely. And that's the thing. I'm 100% convinced that unless somebody does their own research and unless they convince themselves that something is true, you know, I mean, we could sit up here and yell about this stuff day in and day out. It's not going to make a damn bit of difference. Yep. It, pe people have to go out and they yep. have to look at the information for themselves. And it's much more effective that way. Because then it doesn't matter if I say something or, or Josh, if you say something. Because doing your own research is, is the ultimate way uh, of trying to get to the bottom of what is really going on. And I can guarantee you, if I didn't look into any of this stuff... Yeah, or or Josh, you didn't look at any of this stuff for yourself. You know, we would have a completely different mindset as to as to what's really going on, and it would be flawed because we didn't take the step of actually looking into this stuff for ourselves. And you have to do that; otherwise, you're always going to be relying upon somebody else to tell you how to perceive reality. So it's vitally important that you research everything that you hear, everything that people tell you. So you can find out for yourself if it's true or not. And that's the best determination for people to figure out what is really going on. Yep, and that's exactly how they've um, created this uh, this environment with the phony patriot movement and truth movement up to this point is by uh, getting people to surrender, looking things up for themselves. And, and with the Internet, it's made it easy to, to prey on those type of people. And... Uh, you know, unfortunately, now we're, we're here trying to undo all that. But I think that, uh, as you said, if people will just look into this stuff for themselves and not believe me or you and just actually look at the information and do the research, um, they're going to find things that is, is going to really flip them completely upside down, flip their whole world upside down. And some people are ready for that kind of information and some people aren't. And I think it just it boils down to a, cho to a choice. It's kind of like the red pill, blue pill all over again. Round two, you know, do you want to? You don't want to stay in your your safe patriot truthville, or do you want to take you know see far how far down the rabbit hole really goes? The choice is up to you, and not up to me, or not up to Lee. Well, sure, it's uh, well. All I can say is that again, do your own research and look into everything for yourself, and and that's the only way you can do it. And uh, the the good thing is that I think more and more people are are absolutely uh, doing more and more shows that are outside the realm and scope of. Uh, of all these talking points and, and this prepackaged patriot and alternative media garbage that's out there, and uh, I think that's a, a definite good step in the right direction. I think we've come a long way in a few years, but there's still a long way to go. And well, you know, we just have to keep pounding away at it and see where all this leads us. But Josh, we got about a couple minutes left in the broadcast. Is there anything else that you would like to relay to the audience? Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to bring up? We've got two minutes left, so uh, feel free to tell the audience anything that's on your mind. 
Awesome. And uh, I just want to tell everybody that uh, in case people were wondering when they could catch my show now, I actually, um, for a long time, I had my show uh, varying. It wasn't coming on at the same time. It's still kind of that same way. But uh, as of uh, January 2nd of this year, we have started doing the show at uh, around about the midnight hour, Central Standard Time, uh, give or take 15 or 20 minutes during some shows. But uh, so every night, uh, Monday through Friday from uh, midnight Central Standard Time on to when I get done, that's when we're doing the radio show now at my website, thegobalreality.com. So I hope people come over there and check it out. And uh, while you're there, pick up a DVD or a Blu-ray or a package or something from that. And uh, they can also uh, make donations to my work and what I'm doing there at my website, thegobalreality.com. And also, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing another two-hour presentation on the Secret Volume 2 on Red Ice Radio coming up soon. I've been asked to go back on that show. I don't have an exact date yet, uh, but I want to let you and let everybody know that... Uh, uh, that's going to be happening, and it was a really huge thing for my show last time. Getting on there brought me a whole lot, a whole lot of new listeners, and uh, I think having the opportunity to be able to get this information we talked about here tonight, Lee, out to that audience again—that's a great opportunity. Absolutely, that's fantastic, and uh, yeah, definitely let me know when that happens. Like to check out that interview; should be interesting. Well, Josh, hey, I just want to thank you for coming on. I, I know we haven't done a show in a long time. But uh, it was good talking to you, and hopefully we can do another show in the not-too-distant future, maybe next month or uh, even March or whenever. Whenever we can uh, get a hold of one, hour, we'll definitely do it in our broadcast. Awesome, man. I'd love to come on and update you on uh, what I'm doing in the next film. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Josh. Stay on the line. I want to talk to you after we get out there. But, um, yeah, folks. Uh, okay. All right. Cool. Excellent. Well, folks, we've got 30 seconds left. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight, and uh, we'll get this archive up. Hopefully sometime tonight. If not tonight, definitely tomorrow.